Good morning, everyone. My name is Grady Bradford. I am the Industrial Sales Director for ArcZada. And <clears throat> we are here this morning uh, for the ArcZada 2022 Plant Operator Seminar. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items in making today's event simple. This is an example of the attendee interface over here. You should see something similar on your own computer desktop in the upper right corner. The audio defaults to your computer's speaker system. If you would prefer to join over the phone, just select telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to the presenter by typing into the questions pane of the control panel, which you may send at any time during the presentation. We will monitor the questions and present them to the speaker as they come in. Additionally, this year we have added poll questions as many states require proof of engagement from the audience. You're required to answer the poll questions scattered periodically throughout the seminar. Each is one question and should only take about 30 seconds to answer. If you do not answer, we would not be able to confirm with the states that you are engaged and fully participated in the seminar. Please email Sarah if you need to know CEU credits you will be granted for this seminar presentation. I would like to introduce uh, Eric Loomis. Uh, Eric is our first presenter. And let me read you a short bio of Eric. He is the Director for Commercial Operations for Oxada Wood Protection Business Unit. He has more than 15 years of experience in wood protection, preservation business in research and development, manufacturing, production, and sales. Eric has a BS chemical engineering degree from Auburn University and is an active member of the American Wood Protection Association and the WWPI, Western Wood Preservers Institute. Eric will be giving us an update on Art Zada. Lots happened in the last year. Eric, it's all yours. Thanks, Grady. Um, you know, for those who don't know me, as Grady uh, mentioned, I'm the Director of Commercial Operations for the Wood Group out of North America. Um, you know, mainly manage the the sales team and the commercial side of the business, uh, while you know helping out on some of the operations and logistics, just making sure that everyone uh, gets what they need. Um, so I was asked to give a update on you know what's happened uh, with Arcsada and the business. Um, I think the uh, the biggest change from um, you know from probably the last time we met, um, which would have been this time last year, is that we're no longer operating under Lanza. Um, so Lanza had uh, put us on the market to sell to Lanza was previously uh, you know split into specialty chemicals and a pharmaceutical division, and they decided to uh, spin off or sell the specialty chemicals division, which is the Wood Group is a part of. Um, so that happened over the summer. Um, there was a little bit of an integration period, and then around, um, you know, probably October, November, uh, someone's sharing their screen. Um, so around, I think it was October, November, uh, the, uh, you know, the new name for um, the specialty chemicals group was uh, put together, and that is Arxada, as, as you can see on the screen and referenced earlier. Uh, so again, the Wood Group is part of the Specialty Chemicals Division. Um, it's a, a large division um, focused in uh, you know numerous um, you know numerous products. Uh, that you know in general the revenue is a little over two billion dollars for that Specialty Chemicals Division. So um, a, a large a large chemical business that you know the Wood Group is a part of. Um, in terms of you know operating, everything is uh, you know still the same outside of the name change, and still in some cases the the invoices still actually say Arch Wood Protection, depending on which product you're buying. 
um, the, the people are still the same. We continue operating, you know, we'll continue operating the same. And um, hopefully you, you, you've seen that with your, you know, your local reps or uh, the folks that you normally do business with, those uh, should, should be the same. Um, in terms of the, you know, the just over general general business, um, I think, um, you know, the the big focus we've had the last couple of years, and you know that everyone is seeing is just general, you know, supply chain, raw materials, uh, logistics, uh, making sure that we're doing everything that you know that we can to keep you know our customers and our partners, um, you know, supported with chemical. Um, that's a you know, in in, in these days, that's a uh, you know ever changing time period of you know which um, you know, which uh, fire you're, you know, you're fighting that specific day. Um, but, you know, still, uh, you know, with communication and, um, you know, keeping everyone, uh, you know, up to date with, you know, what the status is, you know, we're, you know, we, we continue to support those efforts. Um, the last thing I will, you know, speak to is, um, you know, specifically to the seminar. Um, we, we host this so that, you know, you can get credits so that I specifically can get credits. But um, in, in general, um, there are certain things that we have to do. Uh, there'll be certain presentations that I'm sure you've seen before or heard before that are, you know, just exhilarating and exciting for you. Um, but understand that, you know, we have to do those in order to give you the credits to continue operating. Um, with that being said, we're always looking for new content, new ideas. Um, some of the information that um, that we have put together have come from ideas in the past. So whether it's um, at a you know end of the day survey or you know sending something to your sales rep, um, please let us know what we can do to you know make this better for you or more exciting for you or to offer content that we necessarily had not thought of. Now some of it we may have thought of and the states just won't give us credit for it. Um, you know, but we can always, you know, reevaluate that. So I, you know, just as you're going through these, if there are things that you, you know, have not heard or that you want to hear, please mark those down, get that information to your contact with ArcSada. And um, like I said, we're always looking for, for ways to update our content. Um, that's about all I have on the, the business side. Um, you know, I think it, you know, for those who know me or worked with me in the past, um, you know, very open. And if you have, uh, you know, you know, very uh, um, easy to um, speak to, get a hold of. If there's things outside of the presentation or you know things you just want to speak about, feel free to reach out to me via email or phone at your convenience. Um, with that, I'll uh, turn it back over to Grady. Thanks, Eric. <clears throat> Thanks for that update. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Brian Dale Bruick, also our keynote speaker. Uh, Brian is the business development manager for Arxada's Wood Specialties Group. Brian joined Arxada in 2020 and has more than 30 years of experience in wood protection, preservation business, and research and development, manufacturing, production, and sales. Brian has a BS in Parks Resources Management from the University of Ohio. I don't. And his past, oh, I'm sorry, Idaho. <laughs> uh, and, so, and has served on the board of directors for WWPI and the Treaty of Wood Council. And Brian is going to talk to us about innovation and trends in non pressure protection. The floor is yours, Brian. Great. Thank you very much, Grady. We'll forgive you for that uh, that slight there. Uh... Thank you. <laughs> uh, so great. Today I'm just going to talk real quickly about some uh, innovations and what we've got in going on in non-pressure treatment uh, protection here these days. Um, uh, Sarah, I don't not have control. All right, sorry. Let's... All right, here we go. So, um, as you know, you know, woods woods per overall performance really is is exceptional, but but it it's a reflection of the environment that it that it works in and and how well it's protected from from the the enemies in that environment. Um, 
you know, we've some of you may have seen that picture on the left. Uh, we've got uh, a building that was where the materials were obviously left out in, in some fashion for quite some time and had a pretty severe mold problem. And that's pretty extreme, but we do see uh, on job sites uh, a, a lot of misuse of building materials and and exposed to the weathering and uh, here you can see some very high value wood products uh, sitting in the mud. Um, and our western climate does provide some some very unique challenges with our our water and uh, moisture regimes. Yeah, there are some wood producers really are going to try and protect the wood um, and the as well. Some are, are pretty expensive, inexpensive, which you see in the with the lumber wrap, which is used on on most products, um, and others. The 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 uh, the lengths that these guys are going to protect some of these other projects is pretty extreme. Uh, here they've laid down OSB at fifty dollars a sheet to cover this whole CLT building temporarily uh, with the taping and all the labor. So significant costs uh, involved in protecting the building. So we've got a couple of unique solutions um, to protect wood in service, both through uh, through the the cut chain of commerce and construction phase. Um, one is the frame guard, which is a, a dip treatment that's used uh, for mold, decay, and termite protection. And then the we've got a very new technology called Lotus Pro. It's a high performance water repellent that we're bringing in for the mass timber market. So I think we'll just, just go through here real quick. Some of you may know something about frame guard. Um, we'll go through some, some very quick. It's a combination of four EPA registered actives, uh, IPBC, uh, quats, uh, uh, propiconazole and boron. Uh, a lot of those you use in other combinations of wood protection products, um, but they're also used in crop protection and uh, surface disinfectants. Uh, frame guard is designed to provide a whole house treatment and protect it against weathering, mold, and mildew, and provide a warranted uh, structure. So it we talked about uh, structural framing and some of those examples, but but it's also used uh, on house trim, siding, battens, uh, door and window, and brick molding. Some of those components that are on the outside of a building that really are the ones that are truly exposed to the weather a lot more than the interior framing package. So is it work? Uh, we've done. FrameGuard's been in use for uh, about 15 years. Uh, years ago, we tested it against uh, 36 other commercial products, uh, both treated and untreated, and um, including products that were claiming that, that they are mold resistant. Uh, after eight weeks exposure in, in, a, in a very difficult mold environment, these chambers are, are designed to grow mold uh, frame guard, we were we were essentially unable to get it to grow to for any mold to grow on the frame guard, whereas other products um, had significant issues. We've also tested it in service um, after after between eight and nine months of full, fully exposed in a southern uh, operation. Uh, you can see that the the untreated looked pretty. Pretty awful, and, and the frame guard looked almost brand new. So. so how is it? How is frame guard applied? It's it's um, applied in a factory environment. So we rather than on the job site, where the whole idea behind frame guard is to prevent prevent problems, not remediate problems in the field. So it's it's applied in a factory environment under controlled conditions. We're usually a spray. Uh, Arxada does build and design frame uh, sprayer equipment, and that's typically they're designed for the equipment or the the type of wood product that we're using. 
Uh, so whether that's panels, lumber, millwork, or, or some small finished assembly or large finished assemblies like a uh, truss there. Um, it frame guard comes in two components that are in tote quantities. So if you look at the bottom uh, diagram there, that's a typical mix system for it where we'll have two totes on top gravity feed down into a mixed tank uh, with level controls and and um, uh, spray controls there. Frame guards warranted for 20 years against uh, fungal decay in Formos and Formosan termite, carpenter ants, as well as mold for 180 days after application and for the original purchaser in 20 years following it. So uh, it's primarily an above ground treatment and for most wood protections. Might see most wood products. So, what's the opportunity uh, for you, the treater, the applicator? Is the, the opportunity there is to provide an added value and, and service uh, to differentiate whether it's your trusses or your other high value products and keeping them from degrading during construction delays and uh, add value to, to other products that are. That are essentially commodity level product. Um, for your customer, your, your, whether it's your retailer or their customer, um, it's offered, again, it's differentiation and uh, opportunity to add value to, to low end, what are, used to be low end, low cost materials. Um, and then to protect the, the, the package during extended construction delays. So let's move on here real quick, unless there's somebody had some questions on frame guard. Um, talk a little bit about Lotus Pro water repellent, which is kind of the new and exciting stuff we've been working on. Uh, today's mass timber is is doing some, they're doing some really great things with uh, large blocks, large pieces of wood, but uh, they are still wood and they need some experience protection from exposure. Um, they do get exposed during manufacturing. These uh, They're building buildings year round and they are exposed to rain, sun and, and construction dirt. So we've developed uh, Lotus Pro, which is a novel new water repellent uh, that has some super hydrophobic qualities. It's a very different technology. It's based on diatoms, which are a free-floating, uh, mostly silica-based uh, microorganism that, that uh, floats around in the ocean. So uh, it's, you may have heard of, for, for those of you in a treating plant that use a filter press or something like that, you may have heard of the, the diatomaceous earth that's used to charge your filter presses, the white powder, that, that's an, also an element uh, or derivative of, of uh, the diatoms. So this has been manufactured a little bit, but it, they're incorporated into a coating that, that gives a, a very, very high level of water repellency. And we combine that with a mold, in, a mold inhibitor to give uh, long-term protection for mold. I should back up. Some of that technology is used uh, currently um, in the marine marine industry for protecting offshore oil rigs from corrosion, and it's also the the other wood end application is in use for the edges edge sealants on some of the laminate floorings, the the high tech wood wood floorings. To, so, so what is the Lotus effect? Really, uh, if you look down the lower left there, you can see uh, how lotus leaves have this ability to create water bees that really stand up on themselves, uh, much like a duck's back. And and we can actually measure that, the, the water repellency and the hydrophobic properties. Um, this is, if you look down there on the, the, the lower left there, you can see that angle. Uh, we'll measure that angle. And then also this angle over here, 
and you can see that this angle here, the, the greater this angle, uh, the greater degree of water repellency. So we can actually quantify that, that level of water repellency. So let's talk about the features and benefits. So this is a, a coating that was carefully formulated, provides great UV resistance. It's got a very low application rate compared to the current technologies out there. Um, and it's water-based and, and, and has all the other qualities that a good coating does. It's not gonna stain concrete and it resists the wear and tear. It's low VAOC, has a good environmental profile um, and it, it's fast drying and but still allows water uh, vapor transmission. So I got a couple of graphs here. There's I think four. So we're going to go through them pretty quick here. But so if just focus here on on this side here. This is a a um, th this is a, a uh, an immersion test here. After 12 days, you can see that untreated has this very high level of water absorption. The current incumbent technology out there is performing just not a whole lot better than untreated. And then Lotus Pro has, has um, a significant reduction. This is a very severe test. These are, these are essentially immersed in water for 12 days. And here, sorry, we're going to move through these here, but you can also see here that that um, in an immersion test, where at 13 days uh, the the competitor took was at a 20% water uptake, where it took 27 days for Lotus Pro to meet that that uh, level of of water absorption, and 27 days of immersion is long past what any uh, any common construction practices gonna endure. So how does it, what's the real world? This is a one month exposure of, of a CLT uh, uh, end cut. Here you can see the Lotus Pro down in, in the lower left part of the diagonal there is performed very well, no mold and very good uh, dimensional stability. On the uncoated side, we're seeing significant mold growth and you're seeing the the checking or the the um, the uh, higher rates of shrinkage. Excuse me, I'm getting a message here. So um, mold. I'm uh, not going to spend a lot of time on this, but the mold. Interesting here that we tested uh, some of the other coatings, and we found that that uh, really untreated was not great. But we also found that that the commercial products out there, the waxes and some of the other water pellets, actually increased the propensity for a product to have mold on it. Um, after after eight weeks, uh, we were just starting uh, to see mold growth. Whereas, whereas the other the competing products had significant mold growth and even as well as the control. Excuse me, Brian. Yeah. I have a question from the audience. Yeah. Ask if Lotus Pro can only be used for mass timber or can it be used for other wood products? It can be it can be used for for uh, mostly is intended intended for CLTs, blue lambs, and those kind of products. Um, it can be used on other products without if a a dunnage or a sticker or lap is put in between the the pieces. Um, so if you're looking at uh, lumber and that kind of thing. Yes, it could be used for that, but but you'd have to be uh, careful about what's called blocking. Uh, okay. it, and it's not it it, it would not uh, at this point in uh, development we it would not be useful for 
uh, say a hot a hot product like an LVL or something like that that goes into a hot pack, a dead pack. Okay, thank you. Okay. I think that's their question. Uh, we are we are promoting this not in in also the SIPs the structural insulated panel market as well, which is an OSB uh, product that has a foam uh, core that's used in the structural walls. Okay, I've lost control. There we go. Okay, I think this is the last graph. This is actually kind of interesting stuff here. So we, in in the mass timber markets and even in glue lamps, they, they like to have the wood look uh, bright and clean. And and as you know, some of you who, who are in the in the wood trading business see that, that wood can have propensity to get suntanned when it's out in the yard. If, if you have a, a unit that's partially exposed to the sun, maybe has another unit blocking it in front and you'll see uh, it'll get a line and essentially the wood gets suntanned and that's that's a very undesirable trait in the, the CLT mass market uh, users so it's important to have UV protection here you can see this is this is a, a measurement of the, the change in color generally the a human eye detects somewhere around a 10 on on the on the delta e scale so uh, you've got this is the lotus pro in three different application rates and so about 10 so after this is in a very this is in a weatherometer type test that's used by paint companies and a thousand hours i think is equivalent to somewhere around pretty close to two years in in florida so you can see even after a thousand hours, we're still seeing very good levels of protection with Lotus Pro, whereas an untreated product is, is uh, excuse me, that's not untreated, that is the market, the incumbent product that's commonly used on, on CLTs is not providing much protection. So. One of the other big, Big problems with uh, with some of these mass timber construction is is dirt and soiling. There are people walking on these structures. They're exposed to the environment. There's dust, dirt blowing around, and we found that some of the coatings uh, can actually pick up dirt and, and cause a, a soiling attraction. Whereas the Lotus Pro has a res has a resistance type quality. And here, with as you apply the thickness coating is higher you get more and more um, dirt resistance on a commercial side we're we're using a two mil thickness and the the incumbent product uses a six mil so you can see a pretty dramatic difference between these two um, so I, I think we didn't go in through the technical de t application is basically what uh, it's a single coat spray on product. Um, you can use it in, in normal operating conditions where paints and coatings are applied down to about 50 degrees. Um, the application rate, as I said, is about two mils. And that means at two mils, you're getting 750 square feet per gallon. And cleanup is fairly easy. It's low, low, uh, low VOCs. The dry time is is significantly quicker than than other technologies, and as I said, related to the question, uh, you're separating wood with uncoated stickers. So, so I think I don't know. Do you want to try the video there? Yeah, I'm going to try to put it on. Okay, this is just a quick video to show some of the performance there. I'm going to take my camera off. Okay. Hmm. Hmm. All right, guys. Oh, here we go.
This is a video that we worked on to show the effects of Lotus Pro um, that was used um, in wood or for wood. It's on YouTube, so you know, may take a minute. Sorry, y'all. Well, to, while we're waiting for that, anybody else have any other questions on the Lotus Pro? I don't have any questions that's come through the chat, Brian. Well, darn, I'm sorry this is not working. Okay, Brian. Okay. You want to finish up with some? Sure. No, that that's uh, basically what I had there. Um, if you anybody's got questions, um, give me, give us a call or send us a note, and I'm happy to to answer questions or do a presentation. Sir. Well, thanks for your time, everybody. Brian, we do have a question. Yes. Um, it's can can it can Lotus Pro be sprayed? Yes, actually, that from for a commercial application is typically sprayed. Uh, you can use something fairly low low uh, low tech like a airless house sprayer works fine. Uh, the the two mil application rate is very thin. Uh, it, it's it's almost difficult to get that. Uh, with a brush anyway. So uh, at a two mil application, you can hardly see it in, in a, a spray application is the best way to do that. All right, are y'all seeing my screen properly? I apologize, it's not show, it's not telling me the right screen to show, so. Yeah, no, we're seeing my, okay. my final slide. Okay, right. all right, great. All right, thank you, Brian. Okay, thanks everybody. Okay, thank you, Brian. Uh, I want to remind everybody that you need to remain active during the entire seminar to get your state uh, CEUs. And that just means stay on the computer uh, while you're watching, watching this. Uh, our next speaker is going to be Tim Carey. And Tim is Arxada's industrial sales specialist and has been with the company since 1996. Tim provides support to customers, manufacturing, and users in all areas of treated wood, including production, quality control, process, 
and proper in use. Along with serving customers, uh, Tim has had several articles published in technical journals and serves as the industrial representative, representative for SIGRA, a worldwide utility pole organization. Uh, he is active with many industry organizations such as AWPA, SFPA, TWC, and ANSI. Tim received his undergraduate degree from the University of Georgia and his BA in management from Georgia State University. Tim will be speaking to us about common enemies of wood and protecting it. I will be doing the second part of that presentation. Tim, it's all yours. Okay, <clears throat> Grady, we'll get started with this. Now we're getting back to the core stuff that we have to have to be able to make sure everybody maintains their licenses. So uh, anyway, a lot of this I'm sure you've heard before, but let's just kind of listen, look at it and uh, try to remember every year, the reason why we keep going over this is to make sure we understand the importance of what we do. First thing is that all materials have enemies, whether it's wood, concrete, metal, there's always something that can cause an effect on a building product. And as you heard Brian talk about some of the things we've got from the spray on side, we know on pressure treating and other things, we have to protect building products so that they provide the service life that's expected by the end user. Some of the things that we run into that are um, wood de de deterioration and degradation, that are both that are non-biological. You have mechanical damage, you've got weathering, which includes UV and moisture, as well as chemical and heat damage. Mechanical damage is caused by rain, waves, wind, cleaning, and traffic when they bump into things. Uh, obviously, as you've seen, it removes the sound wood, will degrade wood fibers that are left behind and cause an uneven or reduced surface, which attracts more moisture and causes more issues down the road and typically it's prevented by mechanical barriers. Here's an example of uh, some UV weathering on a, uh, a post there. And uh, you can see, as you know, it just causes it to start flaking off on the outside. And over time, it will continue getting deeper and deeper. And it gets to the point where it's below the wood protect, preservative protection and can lead to uh, then decay being able to attack the wood from the inside out. Moisture problems, as, as Brian was talking about, we've got some products to help with that. Um, but the biggest thing we're trying to do is affect or not allow dimensional change to happen, uh, reduce the warping or bowing of the piece of wood, and also to reduce cracking, checking, or splitting so that the wood can stay in service. Um, and it's reduced by pressure applied water repellents, as we just saw, as well as surface coating. Some of the chemical problems that we run into out there is if you get strong alkalis, um, they'll degrade the lignin. It makes it become fibrous or kind of brushy. Strong acids will also degrade the cellulose and hemicellulose until it becomes brittle. And we present this, pre prevent this by using more resistant wood or some kind of an exterior coating or barrier. Heat de decomposition, uh, it starts at about 100 degrees C and actual combustion starts above 275 degrees C. And the degradation depends on what the moisture content is and how long the exposure to heat occurs. And typically you see a change in color of the wood, it gets darker and you'll start seeing strength loss over a period of time. And you can prevent this from happening by either using some type of thermal barrier or by using fire retardant treatments in the wood itself. Now we'll talk a little bit about biological deterioration and degradation. We know we have fungi, we have insects, marine borers, and there are some other things out there that can cause problems. Fungi we're familiar with. Um, especially out on the west coast you got to have a lot of mushrooms out there and uh, also a lot of moisture which leads to decay on the thin sapwood species as we see on this deck situation on the left so these are things we want to try to protect against so that people will be happy with using wood products the main 
types of wood effect that you see are white, brown, or soft rot. And some of the non-wood decaying fungi are mold, mildew, and sap stains. And sometimes there's some other things that may occur as well. You always have to remember that fungi are living organisms and they, they're they living off of the wood as a food source. So what we do in, is try to remove the ability of the fungi to eat the wood. And the visible part is called the fruiting body. The really destructive part though is the filaments that grow into the wood cells themselves and they're called hyphae. And they excrete a cellulase and other components that help it to digest the wood or the uh, structure in between the cells. And here's an example of uh, what you expect to see when, with a piece of wood under a microscope. You want it to look solid. You've got good walls around the empty cells that allows liquid to flow. Once you start having a hyphae get into the wood, this is what happens. It breaks down the cell walls so that the cells have no strength left and they start to fall away. And here are your three types of rot that you typically see. You got your brown rot on top, white rot in the middle, and then soft rot at the bottom. Brown rot attacks the cellulose and hemicellulose. It turns brown as you saw in there, and that's why it's called brown rot. It also gives a cross grain checking look to it as it breaks down. And uh, it's more predominantly in softwoods than hardwoods. It's a, it has faster weight and strength losses than other types of decay. White rot mainly attacks the lignin, which it turns white and fibrous or stringy as you saw in that picture and it basically attacks hardwoods. It's a slower progression of attack, but when it's done, it's a much more complete weight loss or strength loss. Soft rot attacks everything, but it's a surface area type, a wood surface type attack. It causes the wood to darken and become soft, and usually there are other types of rot with it because once it starts the decay process on the surface, it will allow the other decay types to get down below it. Molds grow on surfaces of both soft and hardwoods. They typically have pigmented hyphae or spores, and they use the nutrients, utilize the nutrients on the surface of the wood. They don't typically affect wood strength, but if you see mold, that usually means there's good characteristics there to be able to have decay organisms as well. Here's an example of a white mold that's on the surface of wood. Sap stains. Um, th this is a type of organism that grows throughout the sapwood. It's pigmented, as you'll see. Most of you are familiar with blue stain. It uses the wood that's actually stored in the wood cells, so it's not actually attacking the wood cells themselves. Um, it can be significant because it grows very fast. I know down in the southeast part of the U.S., especially from spring through fall, we have a lot of it and it comes very fast. And while it doesn't usually affect strength, it does once again allow other types of decay organisms to get in there. And here's some examples. You, you've got blue stain on this and you've got a solid piece. The other problem with blue stain, if you're a treater, is that it turns the wood into a sponge and it makes it harder to control the amount of preservative you put into the wood. So typically you over treat wood that has a lot of blue stain in it. So that's another reason why you want to control blue stain is so you can keep control over the amount of preservative that you actually put into the wood itself. And how can we protect against these fungi? Uh, the main things is you got to remove the food, water, and oxygen, and make sure that the that it's not at a moderate temperature that in, in allows or encourages growth. So you have fungicides that you do in pressure treatment. You kiln dry the wood, or you keep it saturated, or you apply enough heat when you dry it so that you can uh, get it out of its temperate zone so it can't survive. Here's some, at least on the left, kind of typical things we see in the south where they're uh, spraying logs to keep them overly wet. On the right is something you used to see on the west coast. I don't know if anybody rafts logs much anymore, but that was another way of 
keeping them saturated so that the decay organisms can't get started. Now we'll talk a little bit about the insects that attack the wood. Start with termites and we'll look at carbon ants and bees and then also into the beetles. Termites live in colonies. Uh, they consume the wood as, while, as well as living in it, and living below it. And uh, the galleries will have the frass, which is the leftover um, wood after they've um, devoured it. So they're especially destructive. We see them really bad here in the southeast, uh, especially the Formosan termites, which just are huge colonies and do a tremendous amount of damage when they get started on wood. And this kind of gives you an idea of the termite hazard in the U.S. This is where it's very heavy. Then you've got the moderate to heavy, the slight to moderate, and none to slight. So there really isn't a place that you may not have termite attack. It's just that in a lot of places it's not as easy because the season is so short. But it's very important to make sure that uh, you keep an eye on the wood around and, and see if you do see any termite attack. Now we're getting to carpenter ants and bees. And they use the wood for shelter, not for food, which is why they're much more difficult to control because most of our termiticides and insecticides, they're based on ingestion by the particular organism. Well, since they're not ingesting it, basically they're chewing it and spitting it out. Um, it's harder to control them when they get in there and attack. And they can also do a, a tremendous amount of damage if they get into a, a place because they're making a huge gallery on the inside just to be able to live and raise their young. Now we'll get into the beetles. You have ambrosia, you got metallic boring and powder post beetles. They're usually typically not really big. And the holes on the outside, are not large, but they get a lot, they can build these galleries on the inside. And some of them can actually bore into freshly treated wood because it's soft from being wet. And uh, this gives you an idea of what a boot pressed looks like and the, its size. Is, you get these little oval holes where it bores into the wood. New house bores, and in the larva state, they have been known to survive pressure treatment. So uh, these are ones that, once again, they bore in, they lay their eggs, they become larva, and uh, from there, then they bore out of the wood to uh, go out and reinfest more wood. So it's very important to make sure you keep a control over your whole process from harvest through cutting and tr processing and then treating. Here's a powder post beetle, which we're pretty familiar with. It makes a small round hole. Once again, it makes galleries on the inside. And prevention, um, obviously using insecticides, uh, the ponding and sprinkling. Sometimes they use a wire mesh or sheet metal sheets, and that's hard. Some paints will help you keep it out. Probably the biggest thing is to uh, make sure you've got it hot enough that you dry the wood and you heat it up so that they can't survive. And it also kills if there's anything in there. Now we'll talk about marine bores. Uh, the main ones are shipworms, folads, and limnoria. And they, make, they can do some serious damage to wood, as you can see in this picture. Uh, these are shipworms. And uh, they're long translucent and they live in and they use the wood for food. And if you notice, it looks like they've got a drill bit for a head, and uh, which is why they make these great looking holes when they bore through there. Folads, uh, they're more like clams and they look for a place to be able to live. And while they will bore in, live in something hard as rock, they prefer something softer. So that makes wood a great source if they can get started with it. So it's important to have a properly treated piece of wood. Limnoria are the little gribbles. And uh, the fact that they typically attack in the tidal zone. So as the tide goes in and out, it starts to remove the wood where they have been attacking it. So you get this hourglass look. 
to the piling. So they're very easy to spot and when they've gotten to causing a lot of damage. Prevention, uh, CCA, ACZA, and creosote are the main products right now that are used. You typically don't see dual treatment much anymore, but they're starting to put coatings and various physical barriers on the outside of these preservative treatments so that you can make sure you get a good long life out of the uh, piling in, in uh, marine exposures. Bacteria, they slowly degrade the wood um, and they attack the sapwood more so than heartwood. And they also help fungal attack like, just like the stains do. They, they make it more susceptible to decay organisms. Uh, birds, as we all are familiar with, with woodpeckers, they will definitely bore into poles uh, and different things, not just poles, but other kinds of wood to be able to uh, nest as well as looking for food. And sometimes ones we don't always think about are like cows and horses that will crib on, uh, rub up against, and wear down uh, treated wood and, and get the preserves off. And the other thing that happens is people. Man can do a lot of things to a piece of wood, and we're really lucky that treated wood lasts and does as well as it does. So uh, anyway, that kind of concludes my section, unless there's any questions. I don't have any questions from the audience, Tim. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Tim. That was very good. Well, next on the agenda is me talking about uh, using preservatives to protect wood products. Uh, Belinda, I'm looking for the next presentation, second part. There we go. That's it. Thank you. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay. I think we. Uh... All right. Uh, Treated wood is specifically tailored for its final application, whether it's regional or a species uh, exposure or an in use. Uh, alternative materials to wood include uh, concrete, fiberglass, aluminum, steel, and underground wires, all of which have uh, their own issues. Uh, wood treated properly for its application. Uh, it has is designed for a variety of end uses. Uh, some of its advantages are it's easy to install and use, uh, has great performance features, uh, provides insulation, uh, great strength to weight ratio, resistant to wind, and resistant to chipping and scratching. Uh, treated wood enhances durability and performance features, and I personally think it looks better in whatever application it's in. Uh, early efforts in preserving wood go way back to the early 1800s, uh, where they used a variety of mixtures of preservatives like mercuric uh, chloride, uh, they use zinc chloride uh, early on in the Burnett process uh, and copper sulfate in the early years, also uh, iron sulfite, uh, which they impregnated it with, and efficiency was varied at best. In fact, some were not very good at all. Next. Uh, the Bethel process uh, was introduced in 1838. Uh, it was a, the first full cell process 
and it used uh, coal tar uh, extract from the uh, bolt and, and used boltonization to uh, season the wood, uh, which is the first time that was done under heat and vacuum. You remove the moisture <clears throat> from the uh, wood and replace it with creosote. Okay, in the uh, 1900s, uh, creosote gained favor uh, with the expansion of the railroad and railroad ties. Uh, the first ties they put down were untreated and didn't last very long. So they needed to find something that would uh, enhance longevity. Uh, they used the uh, roofing process, which is initial air something we do not use in waterborne uh, preservatives, uh, but for a uh, coal tar, it worked fairly well, uh, creosote. Uh, and then uh, Lowry process was introduced in 1904, so when you have uh, atmospheric pressure to begin with. Following the introduction of new uh, preservatives, uh, you needed an organization to have standards for those preservatives and AWPA was organized in 1904. Uh, it's been around a long time and started with creosote. Uh, the U.S. Forest Products uh, Laboratory was opened in 1910 to uh, in, in Madison, Wisconsin to test uh, preservatives, uh, develop preservatives, and it's still there today. And uh, Art Zada is a, a member of that organization. This is a list of uh, preservatives that I'm sure most of you are from, completely familiar with, uh, particularly on the West Coast, where they use a variety of different products. Uh, we'll talk about these in detail as we go through, but you can see we have a nice portfolio of oilborne preservatives available out there and and waterborne for just about anybody's uh, need. Like I said, creosote was the first, first uh, commercially very successful product. It is a restricted use pesticide, which we'll talk about more later. Uh, it can, is continued to be used in the United States and other countries around the world, uh, particularly Australia. Uh, it's uh, predominantly for hardwoods, mainly oaks, uh, do very well with it. And it's used in utility poles, piling, and bridge timbers. But mostly uh, over 95% is used in railroad ties. It does very well in ground contact and fresh and salt water. And they've started uh, most of the ties today. Uh, have borates in them, uh, which penetrate all the way to the heart of a heart of uh, the hardwoods, and adds a tremendous amount of extra coverage uh, for longevity. Uh, it can be used in a one step or two step. We make a product you can mix with the creosote uh, borate product uh, to treat in one step, and that's used uh, in a plant. Uh, Pentachlorphenol was uh, no longer manufactured as of December 31st of 2021. Uh, so what inventory is out there uh, can be used for uh, five years. So the EPA gave us time to use it up. Uh, KMG was the sole supplier. It's mainly used in utility poles and cross arms, a little bit in piling, bridge timbers and uh, fence posts, some fence posts. But uh, most of that's being phased out uh, pretty quickly. And uh, it was used for ground contact and fresh water use, but not salt water. It also uh, is a restricted use pesticide developed in the 1930s. Hmm. 
Okay, other uh, oilborne preservatives that you may or may not be familiar with, uh, copper naphthenate. Uh, I know it's used uh, one plant on the West Coast that I'm familiar with. Uh, it has been around for a long time. Uh, it was approved in the United States in uh, 1949, uh, shortly after World War II. Uh, it's mainly used for in pressure treatment now for uh, products that we deal with. It is not a restricted use pesticide. Uh, it's a general use. Uh, and it's available as a waterborne. If you go in to Lowe's or Home Depot and buy a one gallon can, of a uh, brush-on preservative is more than likely a 1% copper naphthenate solution that you're buying. Uh, DCY recently introduced uh, by uh, uh, Viance. Uh, it was approved in AWPA in 2008, but I believe the uh, full-borne version uh, has only been around for a few years. Uh, they're introducing it for utility poles. Uh, can be used for both southern pine and uh, duck fir, the two dominant species. It's also a general use pesticide. Copperate quinolinolate has been around a long time, 1956, uh, registered. That's the year I was born. Approved by AWPA in 2008. Uh, it also can be used as a brush on in cut solution. And uh, it's not normally uh, pressure treated. It's a little bit uh, expensive uh, compared to the others, and availability is pretty low, but it is out there. Okay, let's talk about CCA, something dear to my heart. Uh, chromated copper arsenate. Uh, it, it was uh, used since the 40s. Uh, CCA is 47.5% chrome. 18.5% copper and 34% uh, arsenic pentoxide. Uh, standard product uh, developed in the 30s, used since the 40s. It is a restricted use pesticide uh, and can use from everything from 0 0.40 fence posts to two and a half pound treated marine piling. It unfortunately cannot be used to treat duck fur, so it's not very common on the West Coast. Uh, prior to 2004, it had 80% share of the residential market, but it, we transitioned away from that to the new preservatives that you, know, you see now like uh, copper azole, either dissolved or dispersed. Uh, it is banned and restricted in some countries in Europe. Uh, the European Union no longer allows for it. But in other countries like New Zealand, Australia, and uh, most of South America, it's a dominant preservative. Uh, commonly used on pine poles, piles, agricultural posts, and timbers. Uh, ACZA, something you will see on the West Coast, is 50% copper oxide, 25% zinc oxide, and 25% uh, arsenic pentoxide. Uh, uh, mainly used to treat marine piling on the West Coast. It treats duck fur, uh, utility poles, and piles and uh, fence posts very well. It can be used on hardwood railway ties uh, and laminated material. It also is restricted use pesticide, uh, good in ground contact and fresh and salt water. Uh, but prior to uh, the early 1980s, it was ACA. It didn't have the zinc component. Uh, that was added in, I believe, 83. And then borates have also uh, are added sometimes to boost production. ACQ, uh, not around anymore uh, because of the quats being used uh, for uh, other hygiene products uh, today, uh, but there's uh, four types, A, B, C, and D, uh, originally patented by Stella Jones, which I believe at the time was Domtar in Canada. It is uh, not 
uh, it's a general use uh, and it has uh, uh, amine formulation and a uh, ammonia formulation used on the west coast and uh, that's currently not available as I said so we won't spend time on that. Copper azol is the prominent uh, preservative used on uh, hem fur and uh, uh, dug fur and uh, southern pine and red pine. Uh, is very versatile in, in two uh, classifications, type B, uh, which is uh, copper plus tibiconazole, type C, which is uh, copper plus tibiconazole and propiconazole. First developed by Hickson in Europe uh, and AWPA approved and then micronized was uh, introduced later, mainly used for Southern Pine, uh, probably the predominant product used for Southern Pine. And it's a dispersion rather than a solution where it, the copper, uh, basic copper carbonate is ground up uh, to these tiny, particles uh, is used widely on easy to treat pine uh, main product at Home Depot and, and all of the wide boards at Lowe's use MCA now in the east and it was uh, approved in uh, 2017 by AWPA but it's been around a lot longer. Some metal free products that uh, are sort of limited in their exposure uh, but uh, PTI is propiconazole, tibiconazole, and imidacloprid. Uh, all three of these are general use pesticides. Uh, PTI was developed by Archwood, uh, one of our former owner, uh, used for above ground use and is AWPA and WDMA approved, and that's the wood doors and window guys. Uh, SBX is uh, borax uh, uh, tr penetrates really good. Uh, the only issue with it, it goes in easy, but it comes out easy in any kind of rain event. So it's all, it's used as an interior use product. Also AWPA approved. And the last is EL2, which is uh, produced by Viance, and it's uh, DCOI and 2% in uh plus a moisture controlling agent. Uh, used for above ground use only. Uh, Lowe's carries it uh, and it's AWPA approved. Um, others that uh, I don't believe are used anymore but are still listed in AWPA Copper HDO, KDS, KDS Type B. Uh, don't, I'm sure you won't run into it on the West Coast. Uh, treatment additives. Uh, you can add all kinds of things to your work solution. Uh, some you need, some you don't have to have, but sometimes you're good. Uh, I'm sure everybody's familiar with the moldicides, OIT and MIT, CMIT. Uh, colorants, uh, on the West Coast, a lot of that is uh, sprayed on pretreatment, and then they're treated. I do like those products, they are very, uh, consistent in their color and coverage. Uh, penetration enhancers helps with penetrating. We make, uh, whoops, Linda, can I go back? There we go. Um, Pre-stains, I talked about those, I like them. We make uh, Permobuco. Uh, water repellents, uh, Lumbrella's our brand. Uh, helps for the first two or three years uh, after you treat it on a deck, prevents swelling and shrinking. And then surface treatments that uh, Brian went into detail talking about. Okay, uh, different uh, preservative types, uh, restricted use and general use. Uh, talked about those sometimes referred to as unclassified but I'm not familiar with that. Uh, waterborne like CCA, ACZA, and oil borns like creosote and penna are gonna be restricted use. Uh, general use is gonna be 
some of your other waterborns, copper resolve, ACQ, metal free products, and then copper nap, copper eight, and DCOI. Okay, how do you determine uh, if a pesticide is restricted use or, or general use? Uh, they, they have uh, ways to do that, uh, the toxicity, uh, and then once it's determined that it is restricted use uh, pesticide, then you have to have it on your label, which we'll take a look at in just a moment. Uh, and the reasons for the restrictions must appear. Uh, they have all kinds of requirements. Uh, and restricted use pesticides are not available to the general public. You have to have a uh, applicator's license and that's why we're here today. Okay, uh, who is a certified applicator? Uh, someone using a restricted use pesticide to uh, protect wood products. Uh, so if you uh, apply or supervise the use of restricted use pesticides, you must be uh, certified. Uh, EPA sets the minimum standards of comp com competency. Certification is completed at the state level, must be certified in each state where the restricted use pesticide is applied. And we, we're going through this right now. Okay, what is a, the, defi the definition of a pesticide? And of course, pesticides is a broad name which includes you know, herbicides uh, uh, for plants and uh, insecticides for in insects and so on. Uh, those would be the two biggest. And uh, our, our preservatives uh, tend to do both. Uh, any substance or mixture of substances intended for preventing, destroying, repelling, or mitigating any pest, used as a plant regulator, defoliant, or, or desiccant, and used as a nitrogen stabilizer. And it includes just about everything that you have in your house or uh, at work. Okay, let's look at this. Um, categories and signal words for toxicity. And it includes uh, uh, all of these at the bottom, uh, oral, dim, dermal, inhalation, eye irritation, skin irritation, and dermal sensitization. Uh, but you know, the danger is gonna be a word you see a lot in the, the labels. We won't go through all of this uh, categories here, uh, but I did want to note this is a restricted use pesticide label. Uh, if you use CCA or ACZA or Chris Oatpenna, uh, you're going to see this and uh, it, ha it has on here restricted use pesticide right at the top. Uh, and the label is going to include, and we're going to go through this in more detail later in another presentation. So I'll just mention them, uh, signal word, protective, personal protective equipment, safety requirements, environmental hazards, first aid signals, directions for use and storage and disposal, everything you would need to use it. This would be a general use. It just says for industrial use only, uh, doesn't, uh, still uses the word danger, however, uh, where the one, the use pesticide says danger uh, and poison. Uh, this just says danger and the same uh, categories here. Okay, uh, how do we limit exposure to environment and people uh, at your at your plant? Uh, there's engineering controls. Uh, which you're aware of, uh, one of them would be, uh, you know, uh, the uh, engine, uh, when you open the door, uh, staying 15 feet away uh, from the uh, 
plume that comes out, uh, safe handling procedures, uh, of course, uh, being careful, containment area in the plant, uh, good housekeeping and personal protective equipment, uh, like a respirator if you use it. Engineering controls, uh, a purge is a great example of that. Um, and then they have other things here, uh, material on the drip pad, door pit requirement, uh, door opening, cylinder maintenance, uh, I mentioned that. Uh, treated material removal, you know, m using mechanical methods like bridge rails. Automation in today's plants uh, are, are much more so than when I started, when we had uh, manual valves uh, and uh, now we have pretty much all at, uh, automation in the plant with the computers, the treat right program. Uh, information on uh, safe handling and personal protective equipment, you know, gloves and uh, ear uh, protection if you need it, all of those things. Let's see. Okay, uh, let's look here. We have a calendar, uh, 2022. Uh, we've been giving this out for a number of years. Uh, every plant should have one or two, and uh, it gives you all the dates uh, for when you should do stuff. Uh, I don't expect you to read this. I can't read it, uh, but you can on the uh, calendar. It's got stickers that you can put on the calendar for the days that you need to uh, take these actions. Okay, something else here, uh, purchase order information uh, for uh, treated wood. Uh, and it, it just has all of the things you should look for if you are uh, purchasing treated wood. Uh, to everybody on this call, it, be uh, standard uh, business as usual, uh, you know, in use, exposure, wood species, conditioning, preservative, retention, a very important retention, uh, quality mark, that's important to me, uh, commodity standard from AWPA, and packaging, and then of course, delivery requirements. Okay, the uh, AWPA, American Wood Protection Association, uh, founded in 1904, is uh, the standard writing body for uh, pressure-treated wood. Uh, most countries around the world adopt the uh, AWPA standard. It is ANSI accredited. Uh, I'm on the, the committee, as is Tim Carey, uh, with AWPA. Uh, it has a varied membership. They have strict rules about percentage of each, whether it's consumer, end user, government, academia, specifiers or producers, and uh, Arxata would be a producer of uh, the preservatives. Uh, open technical consensus process, uh, and then the type of standards that AWPA has are preservative standards. Uh, the analytical methods to measure the chemical and the preservative in the wood, uh, inspection requirements, and quality control, and evaluation standards. Uh, more about AWPA. Uh, it's very structured, it's very process oriented. Uh, committees operate uh, with parliamentary procedures, uh, quorums, balance of the committee, written ballots, formal public review, and negative resolution process. Uh, uh, if you want to get a, a copy of the AWPA standards, uh, I believe every treatment plant should have one or two copies uh, because that's where all the rules are. Uh, and if you're introducing a new preservative, you have to 
go through all of these things to uh, to get that approval, which usually takes about seven years to get through the process, at least seven. Uh, and reaffirmation is required on five-year intervals after that. These are different preservative committees. Um, uh, the one we deal with most is P4, Waterborne Preservative Systems um, for CCA, uh, CAC, et cetera. And then we deal with all of these. I'm on uh, T3 piles and ties. And uh, we, are, we, we are members of all of these committees. Okay, um, and retention is based on a wide variety of accelerated long-term studies. This is an example of one that we have uh, where you treat small samples, uh, three-quarter by three-quarter inch uh, is one of them, uh, and then you leave them out there. Uh, this would be above ground and you're checking for termite resistance, uh, you know, field stakes, ill joints, soil block tests, leaching, uh, ground proximity, and horizontal lap joint test. Okay, I believe this is near the end of specifications for treated wood are based on the use categories. And, uh, a lot of what we use is UC4, which is uh, ground contact, uh, uh, like for decking material, and uh, that holds up the deck. C UC3 would be above ground, uh, five quarter inch decking, for example. UC5 is marine piles, uh, and then, of course, fire retardant, UCF. Okay, thank you for your time. Um, leave, let's see what we got here. It's uh, a great time. If anybody has any questions, it's please Grady, send them in. It's time for a poll question. Okay. Poll question. There you uh, go. I'm going to launch the poll now. You have 30 seconds to answer. And if you have not been active during this period, you need to make sure that you respond to the poll. Okay, everyone is finished. It was 100% true. Okay, um, it's a break time. Uh, why don't we come back at, uh, would that be 9.30? Uh, 10 minutes or let's say 9.30. Take 10 minutes and, and we'll start again. 12.30 Eastern, 9.30. Uh, Pacific. Thank you. Thank you, Grady.
Hi, Belinda and Sarah. I have 1230 on my end. Are you ladies ready to go? Yep, let's get started. Okay, our next speaker is Eric Loomis, speaking to us about wood structure and liquid flow in softwoods. I've already entered, introduced Eric, so let's get started. All right. Um, so wood structure and liquid flow in softwoods. This is the um, presentation that all of us fight over as to who gets to give this one. It's so exciting. Um, or, you know, you're like me and you just miss the introductory meeting where these are assigned and uh, they assign it to me. So uh, bear with me. This is um, this one can be difficult to uh, um, pay attention to. It's, uh, you know, I'll just use it. I'll do my best to keep it uh, as less boring as possible uh, while trying to meet all the uh, requirements to, you know, for the credits. So agenda, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the tree growth, the structure of the tree, um, flow mechanisms uh, within the wood, um, grain direction, Pit aspiration, liquid properties, um, improving the flow in wood. Um, and then once we get through that part, you'll see some things that are a little bit more relevant to your day-to-day -day activities. We'll go through some pressure treating methods, some of the steps, and then some of the, uh, you know, the key process measurements. Uh, so we'll you know, kind of talk about the tree, how things flow through the tree, and then how it's practically done and you know, how we do that with uh, you know, the processes and steps that you guys take. So uh, a real exciting picture here of uh, just a, a cross section of a of the tree. Uh, I think you know most people are pretty familiar with um, you know the general the general layout, the the structure, the you know the growth rings, uh, bark, limbs. Uh, but you know in general you've you know you've got this tapered tree uh, growth ring, sign you know signifying the you know the age of the tree and um, different parts you know within the tree, whether they're branches, knots bark um, all things that could potentially impact you know our end goal of potentially preserving you know the wood or preserving that structure all right so um kind of going from the big picture to a little bit smaller picture um and you know please bear with me um you know if you know the outside is obviously the bark here um you know i, I know that's you know pretty common but just trying to go through the you know, the requirements here, um, you have your bark, then your sapwood, um, then your heartwood, and then your pith. Um, a couple uh, comments regarding the, the sapwoods, you have um, you know, both early wood and late wood. Um, sometimes the early wood, we call that spring wood, um, or you know, for the uh, late wood, we call it summer wood. That spring wood is, uh, you know, or early wood is fairly open, as you can see from the size of, you know, you know, of the cells and then the late wood is is more dense. Um, so within the, um, you know, the grain of the, you know, or the grain directions, um, this is just kind of a, a graph to, you know, you got longitudinally up and down the wood, you know, radial, you know, into the wood and tangential, you know, kind of well, tangent to the wood. Um, so the, the reason we talk about this is this gets into, you know, the way that the liquids can flow or will flow into the wood and, um, you know, how we best use those, um, you know, directions to, you know, achieve the process that we want. All right. So, um, you know, Tim had a, a picture of this earlier um, in terms of, you know, kind of a microscopic view of the, you know, of the piece of wood. You know, so we have our, our wood cells here. 
um, you know, again, just looking, uh, going back from the, you know, the full piece, you know, longitudinally up and down, tangential, tangent to it, and radial kind of into the wood. Um, you know, a couple, you know, if I was in the room, I'd be asking a question, which is, which is the summer wood and which is the spring wood. Um, so if I'm, you know, looking here, this, you know, the, the part closest to, you know, to the screen is the denser, you know, summer wood. Um, the, you know, the more, the, uh, the larger, more open cells would be your, your, be your spring wood or your early wood. All right, so, you know, going further within the cell, you know, breaking that down, you have your, um, you know, your tracheids or longitudinal uh, tracheids. Uh, these are the, you know, long tubes and, um, you know, kind of something I was, I'll go back one, or try to go back one slide. So when we're talking about the cell, something that was, you know, talked to me earlier was early on was think of the, you know, the, the tracheids as the pipes, you know, straws or pipes. If you can imagine a, you know, holding a bunch of straws together and then your, you know, your valves or your pits, you know, so if we're talking about a plant, you know, think of these as your pipes. Um, so again, our, our tracheids here are the, you know, where the majority of the flow is going to happen, um, 100 times longer than they are wide. And, you know, the flow is normally 20 times greater, greater in this longitudinal direction, you know, compared to, to others. Um, the uh, longitudinal parenchyma, uh, not a major influencer, um, especially in the beginning. It's more, you know, more influencing how the spread of liquid happens after it's already penetrated. So not a big player in the beginning, um, a small player, you know, after it's already done. Um, your, you know, ray parenchyma is, um, again, not a considerable player there in penetration. Your ray tracheids are uh, some of the water conducting cells. This is where your radial, you know, penetration happens. All right, so pit types. Um, on the um, far left, we kind of have a simple pit. Um, you know, versus the, the ones uh, further to the right are the border pits. These border pits are um, the, you know, the key pits for us that allow liquid to flow. Um, just, you know, going through some of these, you know, uh, your A here is your pit canal where this can, you know, come in. I'm coming up, your S is the cell wall. Your M is that membrane. Your C is the pit chamber. So inside this pit, and T, I'm sure everyone already knows, is the torus. And we'll have a little bit more conversation um, about that. Uh, but again, as I mentioned, the uh, tracheids were your pipes, the pits are the valves. You know, so you get the liquid in, but then the pits are what allow for that, that further penetration. So a you know, a different view of the, the pit uh, membrane. Um, so your T, as we talked about earlier, it's the torus. It's a disc or lens shaped flexible membrane. You know, this can be pushed or pulled against the aperture of that pit canal. Um, if this happens, which I've got some pictures of later, when that, um, when that aperture is closed, you know, then that's basically when you have an aspirated pit. Um, it is sealed off. That means, you know, no flow, no penetration uh, without doing something different, which, which we'll also talk about later. So we talked about kind of the, the base structure of how it gets in there. What are the different mechanisms? Uh, so, you know, some of the mechanisms we have are diffusion, you know, capillary action and bulk flow. Um, so with it, within diffusion, you have a, you know, it's, it's different than penetration and flow. It's more of the equalization of concentration. So if you think of, uh, I think it was Grady earlier talking about borates. Um, one of the nice things about those, is they diffuse or equalize into, you know, areas of moisture. Um, so that helps with some of that penetration. It's diffusing or equalizing through the wood. 
the downside is, is if you, you know, put it outside and um, you know, put it in the ground or it gets wet, um, then you can have diffusion you know, going out. Um, so the, the amount of diffusion you got is, or that you're gonna get is you know, normally relatively small, much slower than, than your bulk flow. Um, it's much better in you know, higher moisture materials. So you know, if you're thinking green dug fur, that's why borates work well with green dug fur. They do move, you know, move into the wood. Um, but you, know, you also have you know, that diffusion is you know, dependent on some of the capillary section or the you know, capillary size, or the cross section or the capillary size. Um, you know, the capillary action is you know, basically your pressure drop um, you know, that creates the, the bulk flow. Um, so we have some diffusion, then you have a capillary action, and then you get what we're really looking for um, is the, you know, the bulk flow. Um, you know, those, uh, you know, that flow can be atmospheric, or we can expand that through, you know, pressure, which is why, you know, we're normally looking at pressure treating. So you can have some flow, uh, but then as you add pressure, um, then you get more flow into the wood. This here is just a uh, standard, um, you know, formula for that bulk flow. Um, basically, you have, you know, some constants. Uh, then you have a pressure drop and the length of that structure. Um, so, you know, we're we're looking for the, you know, the most bulk flow that we can get through there. And, you know, a lot of time that's where, you know, we're increasing the pressure, you know, or the more pressure you have, the, you know, um, you know, if, if if your length is stable you know, you're, you know it, it's, it's constant. When you increase that pressure, that means you're gonna get a, a, a stronger bulk flow. All right, some of the factors that are influ influencing that flow are perme permeability and treatability. So permeability is the measure of the ease by which fl fluids flow through that wood. You know, so how easily does it flow and then treatability is the ability to penetrate that wood and achieve a desired retention. So if you're just, you can easily move liquid through, but if it's not, you know, penetrating and it comes back out, it doesn't do much for, you know, for our exercise of protecting that wood. You know, the, what you really want is something that flows well and that's very treatable, meaning it can penetrate and stay in the wood. And you know some of that is you know the, the chemicals that we're putting in there, the chemical reactions that are taking place with that wood fiber, the you know the basic chemistry science allows that to treat versus just water, where you may you know push it in, pull it out, you know that doesn't really do anything for your you know for your treatability in the future. So. Um, Longitudinal flow. We talked about these tracheids earlier. You know, here's a picture of a resin canal. You know, I've got a, a question here on my notes um, of you know which you know which are going to provide better flow. You know, is it going to be this pipe or is it going to be I'll call it a a surface? And hopefully everyone is you know shaking their heads and saying yes, this is going to be you know the pipe is going to offer better flow and that's also going to be in the longitudinal direction. So um, longitudinal pitting. Um, this is just a cross section of, of what this looks like. So again, here's our um, you know our pit allowing transfer between you know or into the wood once you get it in the trachea or in the pipe, how do we get it into the next pipe or the cell wall? You know, it's 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 these pits. Um, so again, here's an open pit, and I think everyone understands when this closes. You know, this is when you're you know whether it's coming this way or this way. Um, this is when you're not going to get you know. Oops, sorry. You know, if this closes, that's when it's aspirated, and you're not going to get flow through here. This this valve is closed. All right, um, radial flow. So again, I mentioned, you know, th these are the, you know, mechanisms that are allowing that to happen. 
Um, I've got a, a pretty crude analogy that I use that's probably not um, you know, the exact science, but it makes sense to me. You know, if you are drinking water, you're drinking water, it's going down your throat. You know, to me, that's a pipe, longitudinal flow. You could also soak in a bathtub and absorb water through your skin, and you will get, you know, material through your skin, but not as much as you would drinking it. So think of that as this radial flow of moisture trying to, you know, come in from the side. Um, not, you know, not the exact, uh, you know, science here, and probably not the, you know, the best mechanism, but it's a way that I've been able to, you know, to think about it or, you know, rationalize it that, you know, hey, this is what what this means. All right, uh, just an example of tangential flowing, um, you know, your tangential pitting, your cross-fill pitting, um, but very, very little flow in this direction. And you know, I don't have a good example um, for this one like I did the last one, uh, but even, even less flow, you know, on this one um, versus radial and uh, longitudinal, or uh, longitudinal and uh, radial. So, um, you know, grain direction, you know, we talked earlier that longitudinal is much greater. That's the where you get the majority of the flow through. Um, and then you have radial and then you have tangential. So if we're looking at this piece of wood, um, understand that, you know, whether it's flat sawn, quarter sawn, where this is actually cut at, that could impact or affect, you know, the, the amount of flow through this wood. And you know not only with the flow, but also you know the amount of heartwood, sapwood that you're getting, um, you know, could impact that flow or that penetration. So I've got uh, I mentioned earlier there was a you know slightly you know better picture here of the, the of an aspirated pit. Um, again, you've got you know your um, you know your your torus here your membrane and it is closing or you know same here instead of this being open it closes um, think of this as a closed valve you're not getting liquid through this area if this is closed and aspirated unless you do something else um, you know so here's an example has you know the ability for you know moisture or you know preservative to get in here it is closed Um, so just talk a little bit more about the pit aspiration. Your flow in sapwood is, you know, greater than your heartwood. Your flow in late wood is greater than your early wood, and your flow will decrease with excessive drying. Um, you know, so we do want, you know, we don't want high moisture wood. If the if the material is wet, you can't get, you know, preservative into it. However, at the same time, you don't want it extremely dry because that impacts the treatability as well. All right, some of the other things that, that we see in terms of flow are the actual, you know, the liquid properties. Um, you know, viscosity, surface tension, contaminants, um, you know, all of these items can impact, you know, that flow or how that material is going to, you know, get into the wood or stay in the wood. Um, viscosity, that could be, you know, be your concentration, that could be the temperature, that could be specific chemical properties. Um, of that material and in general the higher concentration you have uh, more likely you're increasing you know that viscosity um, the cooler the temperature you're increasing that viscosity um, so you know some of the um, you know want, you know some people heat their treating solution obviously heating you know helps that in terms of you know you know better flowing through the wood because you're reduce, reducing some of that viscosity it's going to flow faster hot than it is cold. Um, surface tension, uh, a good example here would be like the foamers. Um, if you have, you know, you know, a foaming liquid, that's not going to, you know, penetrate very well. It also could impact your instrumentations. That's some of the reasons that we use the foamers, um, help with penetration, break some of that surface tension to allow, you know, treatment into the wood. Um, contaminants, 
uh, you know, particulates, extraculants, coagulants, um, you know, you know, or, you know, there's, or sorry, you know, particulates, extractives, you know, you're, you know, there's things you can do, whether it's filter, um, coagulants, uh, things, um, when you have that material, it's, you're already getting into a small space. Uh, when you have pre-stain on the wood that, you know, come, you know, some of that comes off in the treating solution. When you have wood dust, when you have dirt in your plant, uh, when you have aged solution, solution that hasn't been turned over in a long time, or you're not constantly changing that out, uh, you have contaminants that are competing with that space of getting liquid in there. So there are things that you want to do to, to help with that. So, and some of the other ways to improve, you know, flow into the wood, um, you know, source wood that is more easily treated. Um, you know, I think, you know, you know, for the folks out on the West, you know, we know that hem fur normally treats better than dug fur. Um, certain regions of dug fur treats it better than other regions of dug fur. If the material is there, if you're having issues with penetration, you may need to source wood that's more easily treated, or you may have to have a different cycle depending on where that wood is coming from in order to meet your requirements. Um, you know, drying the wood, you know, getting it below 25% moisture content, whether that's air drying, kiln drying, um, you know, potentially even steaming in some, you know, some applications of removing moisture. Um, you know, again, we just talked about you want to get too dry, but you know, you'll have a better chance of getting liquid into the wood if that water is out. You know, just think of a, you've got a glass of water, if you're pouring a preservative on top of it, you're not replacing that water. You really need to pull that water out first or get it to a point where you can treat it you know, better. Um, periodically filter solution. You know, the, you know, whether it's a bag filter, whether it's um, running a tank and just you know, um, starting back fresh, those are good ways to get some of that out. Uh, that your wood is a big filter. You know, so very, and there are microscopic particles that are, you know, going out on that wood all the time, things that we don't see, but if you can get those and other mechanisms, that's going to make treating, you know, treating better for you. Um, using up old solutions with, you know, and full cell treatments um, for the um, West Coast, uh, you know, the majority of the folks are using full cell, but there also are a lot of, um, you know, wood extractives as well. Um, but, you know, continuing to use up all those old solutions, constantly mixing back, you know, freshening up solutions, you know, running a tank empty and then starting from fresh routinely, th those are all things that help. Um, alterations in the treating schedule, um, again, depending on how much data you're tracking or keeping, you know, there could be uh, mills, moisture contents, different things you can adjust based off of the data that you have. You may, you know, think that you're always getting 25%, but, you know, sometimes you're getting 30, sometimes you're getting 20. Um, if you have a, a routine procedure or mechanism of, you know, sticking a couple pieces, seeing what your moisture content truly is. Um, if you're air drying, is it, you know, do you have a constant cycle of air drying or if you're using, you know, using something else? You know, are you tracking that information? Um, because that may help you with your treating schedule, whether it's to improve flow and get better penetration, or the material is dried further than what you expect, and it's you know for you know saving cost and not not over treating. Um, had a had a question here, just what are some of the other things that you know we either touched on or haven't talked about? Other ways ways of improving flow in this wood, um, you know pressure, you know is one. You know, you know, so we, we talked about it a little earlier on, on the bulk flow, but increasing your pressure or changing your pressure cycle, you know, can improve that flow. Um, heat, we talked about it on the previous slide in terms of, um, you know, reducing viscosity. The more heat that you put in the treating solution, not only do you improve the viscosity, but then you're um, potentially improving the, you know, the wood structure, opening things up by having a hotter solution. Um, ammonia. Um, especially on the dug fir, um, the, the ammonia has been known to help with aspirated pits. Um, so, you know, some of the reasons that, you know, that ammonia is used is to, you know, change that, you know, that structure of the wood or to help with, with some of that. And, um, that's an example of, you know, helping to open up and get penetration. Um, 
And then, you know, we, we, you know, we talked earlier about drying and it's up here as a bullet, but you know, that's, you know, the drier the wood is, the easier it is, it's going to be to treat. All right, so we got through some of the fun stuff. Now we can get to some of the, the treating. Um, so, you know, we talked about potentially different types of treating cycles. Um, for, the, for the most part, uh, these are gonna be, you know, waterborne versus oilborne, um, but there could be different cycles based off the preservative or structure, you know, that you're looking to use um, that, that may help your treating. So the, the two uh, main oilborne um, cycles would be the you know the, the Lowry cycle and then the roofing cycle. Um, the you know the major difference here is one's beginning at atmospheric pressure and one's beginning uh, um, under air pressure. And then for your waterborne cycles, uh, you know you have a you know full cell and um, you know the full cell Bethel cycle, and then you know, some people use a modified cycle mainly in the east for you know for pine treatments. Um, the, you know, the big difference here is where you're starting, you know, with your, you know, your final vacuum and how much, what your um, uh, net injections are going to be. Excuse me, Eric, we have a question yeah. from the audience. Okay. What seems to be the most common reason why bleed out occurs? So it could be some of the um, pressure drops within um, so there's a couple things. It's basically the equalizing of pressure after it comes out of the cylinder. Um, so the when it comes out of the cylinder and the internal pressures in that wood equalize, you know, you basically expunge that liquid. Um, so one thing that could you could try is your pressure release. Um, so a slow pressure release, slowly changing the, the pressure that's on that piece of wood can sometimes help with that, um, you know, with that situation. The other thing could be physically where you're located or physically where the material is going, meaning your elevation. Um, you know, I've heard or seen of issues where, you know, so something is treated at, in one location, it's being transported to a, you know, different elevation. And as those pressure changes are happening, you start having bleed out in the liquid because it's not, you know, hasn't fully fixed, you know, in the, you know, the, the pressures haven't fully equalized and the liquid hasn't fully fixed in the, in the wood. So I don't know if whoever asked that, if that answers their question. Okay, thank you. Um, some of the, you know, the cycles versus retention. Um, this is kind of just a visual picture of, you know, what I talked about earlier, you know, full cell, modified full cell, Lowry, roofing. Um, again, this is depending on what preservative you're using, um, what, um, you know, what your, what your product category that you're treating. And at the end of the day, there are different ways, um, you know, to leave, you know, more, more or less chemical in the wood, depending on what your end goal is. Um, so kind of just a visual representation of a full cell, you know, you know, fully treating that material, um, you know, modified full cell, you know, the empty, you know, with even less, one and a half gallons per cube and roofing with one, um, you know, three gallons per cube, that's, that's definitely more of a pine type number. Um, if we're talking Western species, you know, you can still have these same cycles. It's just the, you know, the scale of what you're leaving in the wood. It may be, you know, two gallons per cube on, you know, him for one and a half on Doug for just all these, you know, could be back down some. Um, just one other, you know, someone would ask, why would you do one versus the other? Um, you know, it could be freight, could be shorter cycle times, um, could be needs of, you know, you're able to meet the requirements of, of what you're looking at. So, um, sometimes there's advantages and disadvantages of, um, you know, the different cycles. All right, so now we're really getting into the, the new stuff for everybody on the cycle, get to tell you how the treating cycle works. Um, I'm, I'm sure most, uh, most of y'all can probably give this, this part of the presentation as well. Okay, um, Eric, excuse me, yep. we have a question. Does sure. cold versus warm timber being treated in different seasons, summer versus winter, have any effect on flow, penetration, retention? Yes, very much so. Whether it's the wood or the solution, 
you know, if you have a frozen piece of wood, it's not going to treat as well. You're not going to get the same penetration. And the same way, if you have, you know, whether it's lumber or poles sitting out in the sun that are getting very hot, they're going to treat very well. And again, there's there's good and bad to that. If you're if you have hot wood, then it's going to treat very well, but you've got to monitor your injections or your manager's gonna be wondering why your chemical cost is so high. Your sales rep may be happy with you that you're using more chemical, um, but you know, at the same time, you may not be competitive because you're putting more in the wood. Um, another disadvantage of hot is well, when you have hot wood, you're more likely to have, you know, cause some other reactions. You know, when you increase the temperature, whether it's wood sugars, um, you know, whether it's extractives, whether it's maybe, you're just on the air of some type of chemical instability, that heat will speed it up. Um, so that's a disadvantage of, of heat, but you will get better penetration. If you have cold wood, you know, iced wood, um, it's going to impact that treatability. And that's why you have to do something different, whether you know that's changing your treating cycle. And I, I'm sure most people are aware of this, but in the winter, you're normally treating a little bit differently than in the summer. Your press times may be longer. You're having to wait longer to get penetration maybe your solution strengths are slightly higher. Uh, there's things that you have to do uh, depending on you know, the conditions of the wood or the liquid. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, so starting from a cycle of you know, what this looks like, the, the first thing we want to know is we've got to calculate our wood tally. You know, what are we putting in the cylinder? How much are we going to treat? You know, and then, you know, what is our desired retention? Are we treating this to above ground, ground contact, structural? You know, what is, you know, you know what are the standards or how does this need to be treated? Um, you know, you're considering your expected solution uptake. You know, you may have one or two, you know, work tanks. Maybe you have one for ground contact, one for above ground, or one for timbers, one for lumber. Um, what is that solution concentration that you need in order to, um, you know, meet that requirement? And you're also looking at your tank readings. I'm going through this as if it's a manual process, and there's some um, other information at the end as though it was, you know, we were using a control system like TreatRight. Uh, but if you're starting manual process, you need to know, you know, what do you have, how do you want it treated, and you know, what are we going to use, and how do we calculate? All right. So what's next? You know, the, we've we've done our calculations. You know, the material is in the cylinder. You know, we've closed the door, and now we've turned on initial vacuum. Um, so we're going to get to that initial vacuum, achieve it, maintain that for a specified interval. You know, what are we doing here? We're trying to get any excess or free moisture out of the wood, and we're trying to open up those cells. I, I think of this like a sponge. You know, you're trying to you know, make the wood more like a sponge so that when you bring that liquid in, you're starting some initial absorption, you know, just from, you know, the mechanism that you're pulling. All right, so we, we have it under initial vacuum. Now we're going to maintain that vacuum and we're going to fill the cylinder. Um, you know, we want to um, you know, fill the cylinder and then like I said, with that a vacuum, initial vacuum already pulled on and you will start getting some selective absorption, you know, especially if the wood is you know, hot you know, or you know, in the summertime, you will actually start getting some absorption into that wood during this, you know, during this process. All right, so we're fill, we filled the cylinder. Um, we're going to record the tank readings. Uh, we're going to equalize the pressure, and we're going to you know now vent the vacuum to a pressure. Um, again, more in the um, more in the east that I see this, but you know some in the west as well. Um, some folks have what's called an AA step or an atmospheric absorption. Um, sometimes uh, letting that material sit, you know, and I'm talking, you know, seconds, minutes, 60 seconds, you know, maybe two minutes, you know, you allow for some of that absorption. And sometimes we've seen where that can help with some penetration. 
um, especially on some of the harder to treat you know species um, or harder to treat material so just a, a you know sometimes this is happening instantaneously sometimes we're letting it soak so to say during this process all right so we started our pressure tre pressure period um, you know the goal here is to achieve the penetration depth um, i think everyone knows that is dependent on you know, species, uh, material, you know, your lumber may have a different depth than your, you know, six by six timbers. Um, you know, you want to achieve a, a specific uptake. Um, so as if we were doing this manually beforehand, we, we know how much we want to put in the wood. You know, we have some type of factor that tells us between a gauge and a, you know, say an assay retention that we need to put X number of gallons in the wood. So we first have to get enough to get penetration, and then we have to leave enough in the wood, which is your retention. Um, so you want to make sure you you know penetrate it deep enough, and then leave enough in to you know offer that you know needed preservative. So you, in theory, we've already calculated what we needed that to be. You know, we had a 0.5 treating solution that we wanted to leave in for. Yeah, you know, we wanted to press in a thousand gallons. We know the initial reading. Yeah, you know, we've gotten to our final. Yeah, you know, we've gotten to that thousand gallons. We record that tank reading, and we're ready to move to the next step. All right. So emptying the cylinder. Um, this could be through a, a four-way valve and using a vacuum. This could be through a pump. This could be through gravity if it's an old Renekill system. Um, you know, there's various ways that, you know, this could be done, but basically you're evacuating um, the material, the, the free material that hasn't gone into the wood um, from the cylinder and getting, you know, an, you know, an empty light, so to say, um, using a transfer pump to return this solution to the tank. We're going to reuse this as a, at a later date. Um, final vacuum. You know, we're going to apply vacuum to remove any any air and excess preservative solution. Um, so again, this is going to help with the drip times. Um, you don't want, you know, when that wood comes out of the cylinder, you don't want it gushing. It's a lot easier to recover that treating solution and keep it cleaner in the cylinder than it is when it, you know, get rolls all through the drip pad and runs, you know, 100 feet on the drip pad because it's so wet. Um, you're, you're trying to get out that excess solution and put it back in the tank. So we've, you know, emptied out that, or we pulled the final vacuum. There's some residual treating solution. Um, you know, we pump that back to the tank. We record the final tank reading. That gives us our final number that says, hey, we, we started with this amount. The tank has this amount left when it's done. That tells us how much we left in the wood. So again, what are we normally looking at for that full cell cycle? It's a you know initial vacuum 22 inches and higher. Um, you know, it's relatively you know shorter uh, final vacuum. High solution pickup. Uh, this again, maybe more for southern yellow pine, but you know, three and a half gallons per cube. If we're talking hem fir, maybe two. Doug fir, maybe one and a half. Um, and then you know, the modified would be that it's you know less than 22 to start with. You're normally using a a bit of a higher final vacuum to get more out. All right. So now we've got a kind of a visual representation of the the chemical so we've got you know here's our you know gross injection or here here's where we begin you know 20 you know we've got a storage tank twenty five thousand gallons we hit the cylinder fill light and it's at fifteen thousand gallons you know that's you know ten thousand at the end of our press cycle we're at you know fourteen four ninety at the end of blowback we're at twenty four five seventy so the the question here is what is the gross injection and what does that really signify? So I'd normally call for you know folks in the room, but since I can't see you, I will I'll act like uh, you're answering yourself. Um, but gross injection, this is going to be what's left after the end of press. Um, so if I go to the next slide, 
you know, it's 510 gallons. So we filled it. That's what it took just to fill the cylinder. We got through pressure. You had 510. We, you know, blew this back or, um, uh, but what that amount or at the end of pressure, it was, it was this amount. Um, what that 510 really signifies is that was your penetration or your, you know, that was a measurement of penetration. You know, you felt like you needed a gross injection of 510 gallons to get to the pressure debt or the pressure that you're, sorry, the penetration that you needed to for that, that material. So what is the net injection? What does that signify? So the net is going to be the difference from the beginning and the end. This one's, this one's very easy. Where did you start? Where did you end? Um, so this is going to be the 25,000 minus the 24,570. So your, your net injection is 430 gallons. You know, kind of a crude way to look at it, the 510 versus the 430 is really what I would consider penetration versus retention. You know, you needed to get 510 gallons in in order to get the penetration that you needed. 430 is what you needed to get the retention that you needed. So um, this is pretty small on my screen, but for those who have, you know, treat right, this would be an automated version of you know what we just went through. So the control system is is plugging those in and looking at it. Um, but you know the, this these are information that your sales rep or you know someone or engineering can go through with you. Um, but you know this is understanding you know you should know how to do it manually. The computer system will do it for you. Um, but with that you have a printout or you have a screen you need to understand you know what these numbers mean um you know when you put these in here you know if i'm you know looking at the injection here you had a set point of 3.5 you had a you know you hit 3.46 um you know you, you need to understand what those numbers are how they impact the cycle and how they impact the quality of the material that you're treating so at the end of the end of the time period this computer system may be doing it for you but you still have to plug in the numbers and you have to understand that the numbers that you plugged in are um, getting you the results that are needed. Um, just a, another example, and I'll, you know, so, you know, Treat Right puts this down at the bottom. Um, you know, if you've got, you know, 16,929 gallons to start, you finish at, you know, 14,028, that difference is going to be, you know, your net injection. So that, you know, 2,900 gallons or so is going to be, you know, your netting, net injection. Um, you know, what is your chemical usage? What is your, you know, calculated retention versus your actual retention? Again, this, you know, is dependent on what your, you know, what your target was, what your tally is, you know, your, your use factor or heartwood, you know, how much heartwood is in, you know, we've got, you know, this one isn't being plugged in here, but, um, you know, in theory, there should be a number right here that, you know, specifies of what you're projecting. Um, Cause at the end of the day, if we're talking about Western species, it's a shell treatment. Um, you have to get penetration, but, you know, in terms of if you have a hundred cubes of material, you may be trying to treat 40 cubes of that because you've determined that 60% of that is heartwood um, or untreatable, you know, an untreatable piece of that material. Um, some of the things when you're, you know, trying to go back and forth, um, you know, pounds and gallons, um, these numbers can change, um, but, you know, in general, I normally use 1 point, you know, 8.5 pounds, you know, per gallon. Um, that number could, you know, for CCA 8.4 for copper azole, that number could increase um, based off of the concentration um, or the density. You could actually get the, the round numbers, um, but if, if you were leaving in 25 pounds per cube divided by 8.4, that gets you 2.98 gallons per cube. Um, so understand whether we're talking to you or you're talking internally, 
you should be able to convert back and forth between pounds and gallons like you can between, you know, let's say feet and inches. You should know that, um, you know, how to get back and forth to, to talk in the same units. So we talked earlier about in the beginning of how you, um, you know, figure out what you need. So, you know, here's some examples of, you know, calculating the, you know, the amount of solution that's required. So what is your desired assay? What is your solution strength? That tells you how much you need to leave in the wood. So if I have a 0.05 pound per cubic foot retention or target retention that I'm trying to get to, I've got a 0.2% solution. If I simply divide that, that would tell me if these were the conditions, I would need to leave 25 pounds of solution per cubic foot in that, in that wood. Um, with that, you can back you can back into that and go a different route. Um, so we'll go to the you know next. Uh, thought I had one with. Let me go back. So as a let's say you don't know you know what your retention is and you know how many pounds you can normally leave in the wood. Your your system tells you that you can only put 25 pounds per cube. You've got two of three numbers, simple algebra would then figure out what this solution strength is. So if you know your retention, you know what you want to target, well then you can divide those two numbers and it tells you that I need X solution concentration in that wood. Um, calculating you know, that injection in gallons, so you know what you're going to leave in the wood, you know, 2.98 gallons per cube. We know that our tally was 692 cubic feet. That's 2,062 gallons required. So if you're looking, if you're measuring device on your tank as gallons, you know, you know what you need to leave in the wood when it's all, all said and done. Or if it's a gross injection, maybe it's a higher number, but you know what your target is before you step to the, you know, to the next step. Um, getting to the same thing I just talked about, gross versus net. If your desired net is 2.98, what does your gross need to be? You know, you have some type of historical number, or you could ask us for that number, um, but, you know, it may be a half a gallon per cube. It may be three tenths of a gallon. Um, if you're, you know, depending on where you're at, if you're targeting two on a on a net, you may need to be at 2.2 or 2.3 on a gross. If you're at 1.5, you may need to be at 1.8. Those are historical things that you would know how to treat to get to that to get to that number. And kind of summarizing, you know why are we all doing this or you know it's to get a quality piece of material there's there's some quality uh presentations later that will you know get into more of this but um at the end of the day you know you need to have a quality piece of wood how do you get to the correct assay you know you're you're really adjusting your solution concentration in combination with your uptakes uh, penetration you're adjusting the pressure the time you know, or the, the amount of time you're under pressure. Um, standards, uh, some of the things, you know, creating in-house standards or having in-house standards, whether those are analytical or process standards, you know, that information, that data, you know, allows you to, um, you know, understand how you need to treat this material. Um, you know, there could be Lanza or third-party requirements, um, or they, there are third-party requirements. Um, so these are all items that you know you have to meet in order to uh, make sure that you're treating properly. Um, and so at the end of the day, you need to know how the material flows through the wood, you know the processes of getting into the wood, and you need to know the math or the quality control to understand how you you know when you're all said and done, you've got the material in the wood and it's a quality that's going to last for the end user that's you know going to buy that piece. So I think that's it. Does anyone have any questions for me? There are no questions from the audience, but we are getting ready to launch our second poll.
All right. Well, thanks everyone. And hopefully you enjoyed another uh, arousing rendition of liquid flow through wood. We're at 93% voting. Ninety-six. I'm going to close the poll. Ninety-six percent true. Okay, that's great. Nice having a very intelligent group for our seminar. Okay, our next speaker is Dr. Gerald Presley. And uh, Gerald is a, an assistant professor at Oregon State University where he teaches wood science and engineering. Gerald did his postdoctoral research at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. He's a member of the International Research Group, IRG, on wood protection and AWPA. He, and he has been published in several professional journals, including Force Products Journal. Welcome, Gerald, to talk, update us on the uh, ongoings at Oregon State University. Sorry, thank you very much. <clears throat> So today I'll just be giving a, a brief overview of some developments in our research program here, focusing more on some of the work that's done at the in the Environmental Performance of Treated Wood Research Cooperative. Um, so we've uh, pursued a number of, uh, let me see if I can move here. Okay, there we go. So we've been pursuing a number of different research initiatives, uh, several projects based on measuring the impact of treated wood in agriculture. Uh, so we've got a experimental vineyard trellis, uh, some treated wood garden boxes, and another project that I'm not going to talk about today, but uh, looking at uh, the impacts, long-term impacts of treated wood when it's in organic agriculture, sort of grand, uh, treated wood trellising grandfathered in to organic certified land. Um, we've also got some work looking at uh, modeling the impacts of treated wood in aquatic environments. Uh, so this is an expansion of some work that was done by Kenneth Brooks and uh, which went into creating a model that we host on our website that allows engineers and um, our engineers to predict the impact of a treated wood structure of a specific size over a specific water body. So we're looking at mo uh, validating some stuff in that model or some predictions in that model. Um, and also we've got uh, some on, you know, other types of work looking at methods for treated wood impact reduction. Um, not gonna get to some of that here, but that's just some of the other things that we do, uh, looking at various types of um, barriers and coatings for treated wood commodities that uh, help reduce the migration of uh, treated wood chemicals out into the environment. Um, so, with that, we'll move on to some of the specific projects. Uh, so as I mentioned, we've initiated a couple of different projects looking at treated wood's impact in uh, agriculture. And this sort of initiative is sort of spawned out of the 
restrictions around the use of treated wood in organic agriculture, which implicit, which implicit in that restriction is that um, there's a significant impact and or on the quality of produce or on the environment uh, or on the land that is certified organic. Um, but there's not a not a whole lot of information out there on those specific impacts and actually quantifying them. And so we sought to actually try to get or try to uh, measure the impacts of treated wood on uh, agricultural produ uh, food production, um, <clears throat> the food production uh, in some experimental six systems. Uh, so we've got this experimental uh, experimental vineyard trellis, uh, some garden boxes, and also did some assessments at an older organic certified uh, apple orchard that contains treated wood. Oh, sorry, I got ahead of myself there. So essentially, uh, what this work was spawned out of these restrictions uh, of, on the use of treated wood in organic ag. Um, there's also some interesting interesting uh, questions that arise out of the uh, restriction itself. So um, despite the prohibition on treated wood uh, in new construction on certified organic lab uh, land, there are allowances for grandfathering in older treated older structures that contain treated wood with the um, assumption that this was allowed into the USDA organic regulations because of the um, excessively onerous uh, costs to producers if they were pursuing organic certification of just tearing down any structure that can tear, contains treated wood and having to rebuild it with an alternate material. Um, so this kind of you know, raises some interesting questions here. So there are, a, because of this allowance, there are a significant amount of, uh, or a significant amount of farms out there that actually are certified organic and have treated wood on the property. It's just that they haven't been allowed to construct it since obtaining organic certification. Um, so if this is allowed, then what, like, what is the impact of treated wood? on organic agriculture, and we sought to quantify that. So our first study is our experimental uh, vineyard trellis. We have installed in 2022, or 2020, a um, experimental vineyard trellis that contains treated posts uh, that of four different types. So we have four different preservative systems that are set out at the site. Um, ACZA, CCA, ACQ, and copper azole, um, different species. And we have uh, next to, or we have 10 posts of each treatment, five of which were wrapped at the bottom, or bottom two feet of the post with a post saver wrap um, to attempt to mitigate any kind of migration or through contact with the soil. And the idea here was to er, install a or install a vineyard trellis, monitor the migration of metals uh, actives that are in the uh, treated wood over the course of uh, an extended period, and look at, and see if there's any uptake into the plant uh, biomass, uh, quantify how much is getting into the soil, and measure whether or not these wraps are having any uh, benefit in reducing. Uh, metal migration from the trellising. Uh, we also we planted uh, Pinot Noir grapes one or uh, one per post uh, at about six inches from the base of each post, um, and then these were set up. Uh, the trellising was set up, and these are currently being managed. Uh, so we've been taking soil samples from right around the base of the posts uh, every six months. And we just last year we just started taking uh, biomass samples, so we're actually taking grapevine bi grapevine biomass and measuring metals in there to see if there's any accumulation from the roots. But then eventually, when these get large enough, uh, we'd like to separate anything that comes that's actually brushing up against the posts and see if there's any effect of the plant uh, touching the trellising material versus uh, not. 
So here's our six six month data for metal content in the soil. So just a quick note on these charts, I've got copper and arsenic levels uh, found in the soil uh, after uh, zero and or well zero months is at the time of installation and six months is after the trellising the trellising was sitting out uh, for six months and just you know exposed to the elements. Um, Soil samples taken roughly two inches from the base of the posts. Um, a quick note here, so we have our different trellising types. You'll see each of the preservative systems either with a post saver wrap uh, denoted as PS um, or without one. Um, and so, uh, and we on the y-axis, we have parts per million of metal that was found in the soil. Uh, what you'll see for the copper data is we don't really have a lot of difference here uh, from zero to six months. Um, we do have kind of one oddball sample in our copper azel, and we are in investigating that to see what the root of that is. But nonetheless, it you know it's one of our tech, one of our replicate samples, so it doesn't appear to be a significant uh, difference with the others. And that's also at time zero, so even before the uh, trellising system was was set in there, so uh, no real impact, no real impact or trend we see uh, after six months with copper levels. Uh, quick note about arsenic levels. So you'll notice that we sort of have a baseline level here at 12 and a half parts per million. Uh, that's sort of a stand-in. So those level levels that are sitting at 12 and a half parts per million, that's sort of a stand-in uh, for our detection limit. So those could be zero or they could be 12 and a half. We don't know based on the sensitivity of the equipment. Um, but nonetheless, I have the bars in there. And what you can see is that after, um, after six months, uh, we do appear, a couple of our replicate samples around the ACZA treated posts um, did appear to have uh, elevated arsenic levels. Uh, but not a statistically significant difference. It's really just one of our, uh, for each of those, it's one or two of our replicate samples that appeared to be elevated, and uh, we don't have uh, we don't have a trend yet in that direction. But we'll continue to monitor that in our 12 month sampling point. <clears throat> Everything else is pretty even. Uh, obviously, you wouldn't expect arsenic in uh, the ACQ or the copper azole uh, treated uh, posts and uh, really just looking around CCA or ACZA uh, for that arsenic migration. Moving on to chromium and zinc, again, uh, similar to copper, we don't really have any clear trends here, sort of just um, levels that are just uh, indicative of sort of normal levels in the soil, uh, not really any differences between our controls and our treated posts for either of these metals. Um, so we'll continue to monitor this again with you know things like chromium, you would only expect around CCA, no real difference from the controls there. And zinc, you'd only expect around a signal around ACZA. Again, no signal yet, uh, just pretty, pretty much the same as the control untreated posts. So moving on, uh, last year, well, uh, yeah, last year at this point, it's 2022, um, our, we got some bio, our first biomass samples. So just a picture of what our, our little grapevines look like right now. You can see that they're planted right at the base of these uh, this treated trellising. And they're, you know, this is one year's growth. They're pretty small, so we only got, uh, we pruned them and got some uh, biomass biomass samples from the prunings and so just one uh, sample we couldn't really segregate any um, or any samples that were either potentially in contact or not in contact with the treated trellising because they're too small at this point but we'll continue uh, to sample these year on year and uh, we may be able to get some differentiated samples this year so what we found for year one metal content, again, uh, no real difference with copper, just sort of uh, levels that are bouncing around our detection limit um, for this for the method that we used. Again, with arsenic, you have um, 
our you know 12 and a half 12 and a half parts per million as our stand-in for detection limits so that could be anywhere from 12 and a half to zero um, and we don't know what the sensitivity of the method uh, and so not really any difference between treated and untreated uh, posts at this point in the study same story with uh, zinc and chromium uh, in the plant biomass, uh, again, just sort of bouncing around the levels that the uh, control would be in our first year. So no obvious impact of the treated uh, trellising system yet, uh, but we'll, again, we'll continue to monitor and would be really interested to see if, uh, once these plants get big enough, uh, if there's any kind of impact of sort of leaves rubbing up against the posts or uh, anything like that. We'll also be collecting uh, grapes when this, or grapes as this study matures. So um, we may be able to, um, we may be able to resolve differences or collect different samples there, either in contact or farther away from uh, treated posts. But uh, we'll have to see how they develop. <clears throat> All right, moving on. So we also have another small study looking at the impacts of treated wood in garden boxes, uh, just regular domestic garden boxes. And this study spawned out of just general interest in the public. So uh, the safety of treated wood in garden boxes still remains a question in the public, but there's surprisingly little scientific data out there uh, investigating this topic. Uh, so if you take a look, I've got a, a couple of clips here, headers from just the you know blogosphere websites, not really uh, necessarily credible sources, but nonetheless something that the public would come into contact with. Um, you know, uh, if you do a Google search for treated wood in, in uh, garden boxes, you'll get returned some results like this: treated wood for gardening, is pressure treated lumber safe for a garden? Is it safe to use treated wood in planter boxes, etc. Um, and you'll uh, inevitably run into some uh, commentary on this. I would say it's, uh, I would say there are, you know, positive and negative uh, takes on it, but uh, on either side, you don't really have any scientific support for it. So you get comments like this. Uh, so depending on the wood treatment, it's either either unsafe to grow food in treated wood planters or the safety has, ha has not been determined. So I'd stay stay away from treated wood in the garden. So uh, again, and you know, these articles are not really citing any uh, scientific data. Uh, there was a uh, a paper from my predecessor Jeff Morell in 2014 that investigated this topic using a, a very small study uh, looking at copper levels and copper azole treated or untreated uh, garden boxes. So this. Um, a study looked at uh, carrots, radishes, and potatoes that were grown in these boxes, separated into inedible and edible portions of the plant biomass. And what they found is that for most types of uh, material that would be grown in a uh, vegetable garden, or that they that they tested, um, there wasn't really any difference between treated or untreated garden boxes, except for carrot tops, so the inedible or uneaten portions of carrots. Um, it's unclear from the study though that if you were, or whether these um, differences were due to just a small sample size because because this was a uh, fairly small study or if there was a real difference. So we sought to pr pursue this topic further and get some uh, longer term data on uh, how treated wood impacts garden box uh, produce quality. Uh, so I've got a, a study set up uh, with two copper azole treated garden boxes. This is made with pressure treated two by 12 lumber, uh, just very simple uh, garden boxes that were could be uh, thrown together in any for any uh, suburban backyard garden. <clears throat> and we've also got uh, two untreated Douglas fir two by 12 garden boxes. Uh, right right in the same area. Uh, so the idea here would be to or is to grow common uh, garden vegetables in a rotation over 
the course of four to five years or uh, some period before these um, the untreated boxes start to fail and really uh, harvest the harvest biomass and measure the copper content over time uh, and also look at any kind of metal migration into the soil and quantify that um, so first year's planting uh, we did a variety of uh, common produce so we had uh, each box was planted with the same uh, pattern of, of uh, vegetables. So we had cherry or um, radishes, lettuce, beets, carrots, and uh, we had some basil in there as well, and tomatoes. Uh, so these were collected throughout the year as they matured, and then the biomass was dried, extracted, and uh, the metal content was was assayed. So we have our year one data here for uh, various types of uh, vegetable biomass. Um, I'll also mention that we did separate some of the edible and inedible portions of the plant biomass. So we looked at uh, leaves and fruit or leaves and stem uh, tissue. Um, and what we found is, uh, so I have, uh, I have the data summarized for our first year here. We have um, the biomass type on the x-axis and the copper concentration in parts per million on the y-axis and what you can see is that after one year there's really not any we didn't really find any difference uh between the the uh produce coming out of the two different boxes uh what you'll see is that there's a handful of uh there's a handful of things that do appear to be uh different things like beet tops but that's partially due to that we have a ha we have a couple more of these samples to run and you're looking at a um, triplicate extracts of one uh, box or material coming from one box there so we expect that the variability will increase and you won't really have a statistically significant difference between the two uh, after all the data is run uh, but nonetheless you can see the Copper content in the different types of plant biomass is virtually identical in untreated, from untreated or treated uh, planter boxes. Uh, so we'll continue to run this study out and uh, you know collect a larger data set. Uh, we'll be planting a different uh, different suite of vegetables this year, and uh, we'll be looking forward to see what that tells us. <laughs> Uh, moving on out of our agricultural initiative, uh, I've, we've also got a few other studies looking at uh, treated wood impacts on the environment. Uh, we One of these is a in-service monitoring test of uh, treated decking. So we got a, a, a donation of uh, decking material from uh, one of our cooperative members uh, last year, and this was used to <clears throat> Uh, this is used to construct a deck at the PV lot or PV Lodge, which is on some Oregon State University property. It's a an old um, uh, CCC building that was donated to the university years ago that they're refurbishing for uh, events and rentals and things like that. And when this deck was installed, we put in some collection basins underneath it at three different locations. Um, either directly under the decking material or under the decking plus joists in the uh, deck to collect uh, collect rainwater as it comes in contact with the deck and monitor how much material is coming off of there. Um, and this is really to assess, you know, from the from the beginning uh, as the structure is put in as a treated wood structure is in place, try to quantify what the uh, total copper runoff is going to be um, over time and how long do you, how long is it before um, copper or copper runoff coming off of a structure like this actually stabilizes and becomes minuscule background uh, levels because based on some of our previous work at OSU that's the typical pattern is you get some material migrating off of uh, treated wood in the beginning uh, on its first, uh, or well, 
as it's first exposed to water, but then that sort of stabilizes as the as any surface deposits are sort of washed off, um, and so you you eventually get uh, or you get chemical migration that stabilizes over time. So we began. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. We have a couple of questions from the audience. Okay. One question is: Would the time zero then be the background levels? For which which study the or the great is that uh, the great for the um, the for trellis the, um, grape study the grape yes steak. that's correct so time zero is background so that's before before the wood was in contact with the ground okay yeah I, th I think it'd be if that would that should be I suggest maybe in the future that'd be clearly designated as as background okay but, yeah. Okay, next question. For the decking study, will rainwater be collected away from the deck to get a background level of copper in the rainwater? We do have that uh, collection. We just haven't we haven't uh, run the run the analysis on it yet. Um, so we have been doing that. It's just not showing. It, I don't have it showing up here because. Um, there should be some copper going into the background rainwater because uh, just leaves and other material fall in there. So we expect that there will be just some background levels to look at, um, but we haven't run those yet, those samples yet. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, see, I had one other question, Sarah. Mm -hmm. um, it, it was for the planter box study. It appears the boxes are close to the, the side of the building um and it potentially we see water runoff from the roof of the building will the water runoff be monitored to see if that contains copper i, mean, I know some roofs have copper granules there, there may be other things up there that could contribute to the copper um from uh from runoff from the the, the roof of the building i didn't know if that was going to be looked at separately too yeah so we don't have any for inputs like that we don't really have any way to monitor that i will say that the the roof is not sloped towards the the boxes so i'm not expecting a whole lot of runoff directly from the roof because they're they're sloping in the uh front to back uh direction so yeah, it's not... hard to tell from the picture you could just see that the building was yeah closed yeah so. and even if even if that is the case we do have one control and one treated on each side so it's not there's not going to be a bias in terms of which which you know how close to the house it is because we do have one of each on either side mm -hmm. so if that become if that becomes an issue we should see it in the in the data okay thank you hmm. okay so this is what we what we have so far for our uh water collections off of the deck here. Uh, so looking at, uh, I mentioned that we have two types of collection. We have three locations and two types of uh, collection locations. So directly under deck and then deck plus joist. So under with, you know, under a greater amount of surface area of wood. And what we found is that um, if you, tally up the total amount of copper so this is essentially we collect water get a concentration of copper and then multiply that out by the total volume collected to get the mass of copper that we're uh, collecting with each in each basin um, if you tally that up over time and over a uh, over the total volume of water collected um, you can see that you get uh, the slope of or the slope of the line uh, between each two points is sort of decreasing over time and what that tells us is that this follows a very similar pattern to what we've observed previously is that when treated wood materials are first wetted uh, when they're you know freshly treated or first installed uh, then you get that a initial impulse of copper coming off of it uh, which stabilizes very rapidly over time. Um, and so this is really collection. These collections were done over the course of about two months. 
And so you're starting to see stabilization of uh, copper migration even after two months. Um, so we don't have it worked up in another way yet, but the idea here would be to um, get also normalize this for surf surface area. Uh, so to get micrograms of copper per um, or per volume of water per surface area of copper or of treated wood uh, to identify how rapidly that's coming off uh, for that material. And this is really a uh, n equals one, uh, just looking at one structure at three locations. But um, it's projects like this are are good for us to uh, to keep assessing because over time, as we uh, assess more and more of these structures, it really allows us to give a um, better understanding. So it's not like in this study we aren't comparing different types of decking because we didn't want to have sort of a uh, patchwork uh, deck made with different materials. Um, but nonetheless, uh, we'll see how this we'll see how this um, materializes. You'll also notice that the deck plus joists, uh, the copper levels are generally a little bit higher. Uh, that's to be expected because you you do have more surface area of wood there. And so once we do, eventually uh, make the calculation or make the calculations and determine um, how much surface area normalize this for surface area i think the numbers will look uh, relatively similar uh, for both <clears throat> all right so with that that's um, a little uh, just a short update of some of the things that we have going on at oregon state i'd like to thank all the supporters of uh, the Environmental Performance and Treated Wood Research Cooperative. And I'll take any more questions on these projects. I don't have any questions at this time, Gerald, from the audience. All right. Thank you, Gerald. Appreciate that update. Yep. Very good. Okay, our next speaker and the last before lunch is uh, Rob Dennison. And Rob is the Western Regional Sales Manager for Oxada Wood Protection. He has more than 25 years of experience in wood protection preservation business in research and development, manufacturing, production, and sales. Rob has a BS in engineering from Geneva College and is an active member of the AWPA and WWPI. And Rob will be talking to us about pesticide application equipment. Thanks, Rob. Yeah, thank you, Grady. Um, appreciate that introduction. Um, some of you have joined this uh, seminar in the past. Uh, some of this stuff will be familiar to you. Um, what I'm gonna do today is uh, discuss uh, the different um, uh, different types of equipment that are typically used in the treating plant to um, apply uh, and mix and uh, uh, and meter the uh, the concentrates that we sell um, in bulk uh, and also in towed quantities uh, to the treating plants, as well as go through some of the maintenance issues that um, are more on the routine level that come up from time to time. Sorry. I am moving too fast. So let me, sorry, I got ahead of myself here. Okay, all right. Apologize for that. Um, the goal here is that we wanna match our equipment with our pesticide application um, in order to stay within the requirements from the EPA label that governs the use for that pesticide product. And some of the, uh, uh, so we're in, the, in the next slide, we're gonna look at a, um, a label for copper azole. Um, but the important things to note specifically regarding the application equipment is what are the allowable um, you know, percentages or concentrates for that, um, for, for, the, for the pesticide on the label itself. And knowing that number um, helps to guide us in the selection of the equipment that we're using. So some common examples here for some of the products that we sell 
um, are ranging from 0.1 to 5% uh, active concentrate uh, for CAC. In CCA, that range is 1% to 8%. Um, for our moldicides, the K18500, which is the 14% active, it's a 48 parts per million on an active basis. And for our moldicide uh, WE, which is a 45% active, there's no upper limit, but guidance up to 600 parts per million. Um, looking specifically at a label, um, which is uh, stealing a little bit from probably Terry a little bit later, um, probably a little bit hard for you guys to see, but this is an ex this is an actual copper azol concentrate um, label from us. And in this area on the right hand side, where it says directions for use, um, is listed the applicable range of actives uh, for that product. So you can see here very faintly. And I don't know if you can see it that well on your screen, but it does show 0.1% to 5%. An important note is that um, this, um, in parentheses, this is very important information. It says on a copper plus other active ingredients. So it's important to note that this is an active range rather than a product range, which is a very different number. So moving into our selection criteria for the type of equipment that we would use, um, our main concerns are um, what are the health hazards of the product and what will we need to do uh, to help keep people safe? Um, obviously, with some of these products with high health hazards, uh, you don't want to have any exposure or limit the exposure as much as possible. So you want an enclosed system um, that keeps the chemical product away from people as much as possible. Uh, and also location, you don't want um, to put a, um, a pipeline or um, a toad or something that could you know, possibly leak somewhere uh, in a high traffic area. Um, we need to make sure that we understand um, what the, compa what the um, material compatibility is. If this is a corrosive product, um, we would want to stay away from um, copper or yellow metals or mild steel and move into something um, that is higher, has a higher resistance to corrosivity like stainless steel um, or even some composites, um, plastics, etc. We need to understand the physical properties. Um, this is very important on the chemistry itself so that we select the right pumps um, or look at the right type of metering system. We need to be able to, to get that product from the concentrate form into the blended form somehow and understanding um, how that product moves physically from one point to the other um, is a big factor. Um, we need to understand um, the delivery rates, um, you know, looking at those concentrations and then factoring how fast we need um, or how much capacity we need for a pump to move it in order to have a mix complete in, a, um, in, a, in the amount of time that is suitable for the plant. And then also um, we need to factor in the accuracy of the measurement. So these, some of these products are very expensive and some of these products go in at very low doses. So they require, or they should have a high degree of accuracy. So some of these, uh, you know, just a, kind of some examples of um, the amounts of some of the common products that you're familiar with from your treating plant world. Um, for a 3,000 gallon mix at a 0.65% active for copper azol, you'll see these are the types of uh, quantities that are required for the different components, the common components that you would find um, from us. So you can see that there's quite a uh, variation um, between CAC concentrate mixing and, and CCA. And so that does um, factor into the type of equipment that we're looking to, um, uh, to put in for the plant to, to ensure um, correct and accurate metering. Um, sizing, uh, equipment sizing also, there's some considerations that we have to have here. Um, and a lot of this is based on, um, you know, what are the times that are 
um, the the best times or the the most optimal times um, to complete a mix uh, from the perspective of the treating plant. Um, and on this point, it, it's it's more about um, the time required uh, between charges and, you know, how much does a one hour mix hurt you versus a 15 minute mix? You know, for some plants, maybe that's, that's not a consideration. Um, for others that are turning charges over and switching out their cylinders pretty quick, um, you don't want the mix to be the bottleneck. So uh, these are all, you know, that, that is a consideration when looking at, um, you know, how big of a capacity pump to put in to do water versus concentrate, et cetera. Um, looking at piping size restrictions, you know, some of the tanks may only have two inch connections on them. So right there, there's a restriction unless you go in and put in um, you know, cut out the hole in the tank and put weld in a three inch flange or a four inch flange to go bigger. So sometimes there's a restriction just based on um, some of the existing equipment and existing fittings that are already in the plant. Then also budget, <clears throat> you know, it's expensive to put in big pipe. Um, so those are all, those are all things that we look at here. Um, <clears throat> the typical types of pumps that you see in the plants um, most of you are familiar with the end suction centrifugal pump. That's in the majority of, of uh, the pressure pumps and the mix pumps in the treating plants here. The vertical inline multi-stage would be something um, that you're familiar with too. Um, the Grunfoss style pump and some of the treating plants use those for, uh, for pressure pumps or strip pumps um, or even small volume concentrate pumps. The gear pump isn't typically found in the plants that much anymore. Um, these were put in uh, a lot of years ago when we were offloading CAC concentrate. It actually goes back to CAB. Um, some of the treating plants are still operating these, these old gear pumps. They, uh, the, the most common one we sold was, uh, was a manufacturer called Blackmer. Um, but outside of you know, offloading, they're not, they're not used in, in the treating plant process. Um, positive displacement. Um, that pump would be used for a highly viscous product, um, typically used more in the east when we have waxes that are, um, we have to watch with shear. And uh, I'll go through different examples and some pictures of each so you get a clear idea of what each one looks like. Uh, and then an air diaphragm pump, I think everybody should be familiar with. They're a workhorse pump that, you know, we typically use to do moldicide metering, but they're also used to pump, you know, you can move water from just about any, you know, you can move fluid pretty much from one place to another easily with, with these pumps and they're highly portable. So um, very adaptable uh, uh, piece of equipment. So moving into the end suction pump, <clears throat> um, this is what it looks like. And as I said, you should be pretty familiar with it. Um, the inlet is on the front and the outlet is on the top. Um, these pumps, uh, there's a variety of manufacturer. Uh, the ANSI designation means that it's built to a national standard, uh, which means that if, if there is an ANSI certified pump, it's interchangeable with another ANSI cert uh, certified pump. So that's highly convenient when you're um, you know, trying to find a replacement for a pump that you have and you can't necessarily find the one that you want from the same manufacturer. Um, these pumps, um, are great with uh, high flow rates and high pressure, so they're they're ideal for um, pressure pumps and treating cylinders that, that raise up to 200 or 180 psi. Um, they require a flooded suction. There's issues with cavitation, um, but overall they're a workhorse um, and they and they run for a very long time if they're properly maintained. They do have a mechanical seal that's on the back end by the shaft, which does require some maintenance and replacement from time to time. And those are, that's a slide we'll go into at a later time here. The, ver the inline multi-stage vertical pump, you see these are, this says Titan to the right, but that's a knockoff Grundfos pump. Um, those pumps are really highly configurable. So the way that these things work is that flow comes in on one side and exits on the other, left to right. And the, amount of pressure or discharge head is determined by the number of impellers that are placed vertically in that stack. So the, the taller that pump 
uh, or that, that the part that's under the motor, um, the more pressure that pump will produce because as flow comes in at the bottom, it'll move vertically up through each impeller stack. And as it goes e through each one, it's, it's having the pressure raised uh, to you know, a percentage degree until then it's discharged out the side. So a high flow, low head, so a high flow pump in this type of configuration would have a big pipe diameter inlet and outlet and a lower profile and elevation. And a high pressure, low flow configuration for this pump would have a small inlet and outlet pipe diameter and a very tall stack. So I think you guys are probably seeing these around. This is the example of the sliding vane or gear pump that I was describing. Um, these pumps are, you know, very durable. Um, it's a very simple type of, um, of operation. Uh, they don't require a lot of maintenance. Um, and they work with with viscous products and, and you know back when we were first starting with copper azole concentrate after the CCA days um, we felt like this pump was required to to pump off trucks because it can still handle um, you know some amount of cavitation due to low flow as the tankers were, were running low we felt that these pumps would actually hold up pretty well over that you know over that type of lifespan in that type of environment and turns out we were right because a lot of them are still the, the ones that were originally put out there some of them are still in existence all these years later um, this is the progressive cavity pump um, so this is a moino brand pump and um, these pumps typically are pretty low flow but they generate an awful lot of pressure and they work really well with really thick products. Um, a lot of uh, plants that that uh, produce glue, um, good example, uh, down uh, Boise Cascade plant um, down in Medford used these, a lot of these types of pumps to pump glue. Um, they're a durable pump. Um, they have had issues if you have, um, you know, and, you know, if there's debris in the in the line, or if there's a product that it's not quite um, a, a uniform material. Good example, like micronized copper azole, because the copper particles are in suspension, it can be those that product can be pretty abrasive against some types of seals, and it turns out that the seals that were in these pumps wore out a little faster than in others because of the abrasive nature of that concentrate. So they didn't turn out to be a great option for that product, um, but with other products that don't have um, abrasive um, uh, qu uh, you know, qualities in that, uh, they work great. Um, the one word of caution with these is that um, it won't deadhead. So in other words, if you close a valve on the discharge on an in suction pump, and on the inline centrifugal, or sorry, and in the inline uh, multi-stage pump, you know, the pressure will essentially just stop and the pump will just, you know, essentially just spin and, you know, spin and not generate any more pressure. Uh, with these types of pumps, pressure will continually continue to build up in the line to the point where it can burst a pipeline um, downstream. So, um, Every one of these pumps should be installed with a pressure relief valve to ensure that um, you know catastrophic failure in the piping system doesn't occur if a downstream valve is either closed or a line is plugged. The air diaphragm pump, like I said, I think this is one that everybody's familiar with. Um, it's a pretty simple operating pump. It takes air instead of electricity, so there's no motor. Um, the air comes in and it cycles a diaphragm um, back and forth, left to right, and as one cavity, oh, as one diaphragm opens, fluid comes in, and then as the other compresses, it pushes fluid out. So it's pretty easy. Um, it's pretty easy to do maintenance on. There's repair parts for these, and you can pick them up and move them around. There's different sizes. There's different ways to hook stuff up. Um, the main thing on these, as far as um, you know, maintenance goes, if, if you hook them up to a rigid piece of pipe on top and bottom, um, there's a lot of vibration, there's a chance to break lines, and the 
other thing is, well, I don't know the other, I mean, honestly, the downside is that, um, you know, sometimes it can be difficult to pick up prime with fluid, but the real big advantage is that you never have to worry about damaging the pump by running it dry. So the typical pumps for the products that are sold by Arxata, um, for our bulk concentrates, um, we typically are supplying the end suction ANSI pumps or the Grunfos pumps, and then for the moldicides that have a low uh, flow rate requirement and an accurate measurement, we're using um, an air diaphragm pump. So when we go into the selection process for an end suction centrifugal pump, there's a couple of design considerations that we have to be aware of as we go through that process. And um, the, the, the first thing we need to understand is um, what are the physical characteristics of the fluid that we're trying to pump? And we need to know what the density of that fluid is. Um, we need to understand what, how far we have to move that product. And then we have to understand what the piping restrictions we have in the system are. So after we get those, that piece of or those pieces of information, then we're able to do a calculation on the discharge head, and then we can go select our flow rate range, which is based on, um, you know, the kind of the time constraints that we're working with in order to, to complete the process to the satisfaction of the plant. Um, we go and look at um, what are our inlet and outlet pipe sizes, and then we go to the manufacturer's um, curve, uh, and every manufacturer for a pump um, publishes a performance curve for that particular style of pump and also size and that's based on inlet and outlet dimensions and also um, impeller diameter. So we'll have an example here. So in, in, this, in this example we're working with um, a work tank that we're pumping to that's going to be 30 feet tall and on their inlet size to the pump we're working off of a, a water tank or a concentrate tank that has a four inch pipe size available that's the max size we can use um, we've done some calculations um, we're looking at we've measured that we have 60 feet of discharge pipe and we have a couple fittings that, um, uh, some some maybe a couple elbows maybe we're going through a check valve um, maybe a butterfly valve but we've identified all that and then we know we want to be in the 350 gallon per minute range for flow. So if we do that, we take that example. I'm just pulling this back over from the previous slide. Um, we're going to go with a four inch inlet and we're going to assume a three inch pipe diameter on the outlet. And but we're going to assume the suction head is less than two feet. OK, so what I mean by that is if we're looking at our source tank, um, the best case for a pump to run is when there's head pressure on top of it. So in other words, um, if our source tank had um, 15 feet of liquid on it, then it would be easier for that pump to move the fluid, fluid through. So we want to do our calculation for what we would assume would be um, kind of the worst case scenario. So we're going to say, you know, the lowest that tank will be is two feet. And then we do our head calculations. So we go to there's there's a couple different books that engineers are familiar with um, that uh, look at uh, fluid mechanics properties and and friction losses. And we come up with um, 16 feet of friction loss um, for our pipe, and then 15 feet of loss for our fittings. We add all this up, and we say find out that our total discharge head that we need to overcome in our piping system is 61 feet. So we come to a pump. We say, okay, Deming pump. And this pump is sized three inch inlet, two inch outlet, and nine and a half inches on the impeller. It's a little fuzzy, but you can, it, it's down here. Um, there's another part of this too, and that is the RPM, which is the speed of the motor. Typically a, a, a pump manufacturer will publish a curve. It'll be this size, and then it'll be a, it'll be a, a speed of 1750 
and then there'll be another speed of 3450. So 3450 RPM is really the fastest standard motor speed. And 1750 to 1800 RPM is probably the second most common um, speed. Now you can get the uh, variable speed drives, and we're not going to talk about them today, but um, variable frequency drives allow the pump to operate, the pump motor to operate all across the entire range from zero to 3,600 RPM. And if you go to um, these pump manufacturers' websites now, a lot of them now have tools um, that are calculators that actually will create a custom curve um, and, and, and tell you where to run or where you should run your VFD. Um, so essentially it's, it's saying, hey, we'll, you can use this pump and you tell us your operating conditions and we'll tell you where that speed should be. So it's a little bit, um, you know, there's a little bit more flexibility in the design if you walk into it, you know, with a VFD in hand. Now, if you don't, and you're just looking at performance curves, then you know we'll start with this one. And so what this is telling us is that, you know, I can only really do. I mean, my my target was 350 gallons per minute, but just looking at this, 350 gallons a minute is all the way over here. So I know right away that this really isn't the pump I need. The most efficient place to run this pump actually is somewhere in this region. And that only gives us 190 to 250 gallons per minute. Now, the horsepower itself um, to, to run that would be seven and a half. This is not correct. Um, but, you know, that's an idea you could go back to somebody with because, you know, obviously this pump is going to cost one, you know, one thing. And if we go to this pump, which is a four by three. So that's a four inch inlet and a three inch outlet and a nine and a, and a nine and a half inch stock impeller. You know, this is going to be a more expensive pump because it's got, you know, it's a bigger inlet and it's a bigger outlet. Um, it's going to be a slightly overall bigger pump, but this one's going to run at the, at the flow rate that we want. So if we look here and we're at 350, uh, in this area here, then we know that um, this pump will perform um, where we want it to be, and we know that the impeller that is standard with this is a little too big for what we want. So we can come back to the manufacturer and say, okay, I like this pump, but I want the impeller trim so that I'm running at 325 or 350 gallons per minute at my 61 feet. And they can do that. Now, like I said before, the variable speed drive um, gives the user and gives the designer a lot more flexibility because in that case, they wouldn't have to run at 1800 RPM. They could run it at 1600 RPM and essentially keep the, the impeller at the full size and not have to worry about trimming that, physically trimming that um, down so that it's not putting out too much pressure. Okay, so I know it's a lot, but I think maybe hopefully this helps to clear some things up. Um, you know, all pumps um, have to operate on general principles. You know, we have to be able, to, in order for that pump to move fluid, it has to be able to move fluid from one source to another and overcome the resistance on the discharge line. That's why we do the calculation to get the 61 feet so that we ensure that that does happen. Um, obviously, it has to be able to draw fluid from the inlet source. So, you know, if that, if that fluid, you know, if we put a four inch inlet pump on a two inch line, um, or, you know, it's going to create an issue with with flow rate, and it's also going to put a lot of um, um, a lot of pressure, um, literally, on the front of that pump to pull fluid through. So, you know, understanding, you know, the line size and how it relates to the pump that you've selected is important. And then the rate in which it moves fluid, and you know, and how it's related to the power that is going to the pump from the motor, et cetera, et cetera. You know, if we look at all those things and we come up with our pump.
and we say, okay, the four by three, nine and a half trim to eight and a half inches with a 10 horsepower motor will produce 350 gallons a minute with a discharge head of 61 feet. So there's our answer. And if you put that pump in and you wanna double check your numbers, you can put a pressure gauge on it because a pressure gauge will is, is essentially um, just a, a factor of the head pressure. And there's a handy um, calculation down below uh, that shows how to do that. So for our example, with a specific gravity of one, which would be um, essentially pumping water, um, the pressure um, on that line should be about 26 pounds. Um, this is a lot on here, but essentially um, this kind of all boils down to the bottom sentence here uh, or paragraph, which has to do with um, the relationship between specific gravity uh, and horsepower and pump capacity. So it's not enough to assume that everything is going to pump based on the specific gravity and the physical characteristics of water. If you have a fluid that has, um, you know, I'm not even gonna worry about viscosity essentially because there's a lot of other different factors that go with that, but higher densities. So some concentrates um, are very dense. And if you pick a pump with a horsepower rating um, for water, it's not a given that that same pump will work for a concentrate. And so we're gonna go and look at the next slide here to, 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 uh, to show how that works. So from our example, where we were pumping water up to a 30 foot tall tank, we determined that the four by three, eight and a quarter with a 10 horsepower motor was perfect for water service. Now this slide I got to correct and I've, done this on the one I was working on, but it didn't make it through to this one. But CAC concentrate has a density of 10.4, not 15.4, and a specific gravity of 1.25, not 1.85. So our formula to calculate how specific gravity relates with um, efficiencies and, and horsepower will come up with this. If we pump with water and we do our calculation, we determine that we need 8.3 horsepower. Okay, since we have a 10 horsepower motor, we, we know that that'll be fine. But if we put our example in with CAC concentrate that has a specific gravity of 1.25, then our number bumps up to 10.4 horsepower required. That's a problem because if we run that product at 10 horsepower, we run the risk of overloading the motor and burning it up, um, putting a lot of pressure on that, putting a lot of pressure on um, our electrical service and our fuses and our breaker. And so, you know, understanding this specific piece of information would say, okay, let's move up to a 15 horse motor and that way it will handle both concentrate and water. Um, so common selection mistakes, and I've been guilty of these over the years as I've tried to size pumps um, in different places with different products, um, but not understanding um, the fluid properties, the temperature and viscosity. And viscosity is kind of a tricky one because you know, it, there's <laughs> mainly because there's 50 different units for viscosity and you have to try to figure out, you know, how they're lining up with a different manufacturer's recommendations. So challenge number one, but once you get past that, you can usually figure things out. Um, like I said before, uh, not understanding or not anticipating um, uh, or, or not doing the research on the fluid density itself to understand how that relates to horsepower is another one where put in a pump and it doesn't work or trips the breaker all the time and it's because there's not enough horsepower. Um, putting in a pump that doesn't have compatible materials, you know, putting in a, 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 a carbon steel, um, you know, wetted pump and it needed stainless 
Well, you'll start uh, seeing holes in the in the pump volute, and you'll see your impeller um, disappear pretty rapidly. Um, seen this happen before. And then also, you remember what we need to add? Do we want to put in a a 500 gallon a minute pump for something that we only need to you know if we only need to pump you know 10 gallons for the whole mix? No. So um, you know, coming kind of coming back and just recapping all those things that um, we've been mentioning so far. Um, another thing here, uh, and this is you're kind of taking this issue with um, specific gravity into a consideration with um, not you know not just pumps but also with tanks um, because this is also uh, you know something that's important when you're doing design work in general. But um, when you're putting in a, you know, for two things. One is when you're when you're building a tank, um, the manufacturer always wants to know what the specific gravity is and why is that? Um, because if you have a product like CCA concentrate that has a density of 15.4 pounds per gallon with a specific gravity of 1.85, um, and we run our calculation, that our, our, use our formula that we did that we showed before, um, the pressure that's at the bottom of that tank is 9.61 if we have 12 feet of liquid in it. Now, if you look below and that tank is filled up with 12 feet of water, the pressure at the bottom of the tank is only 5.2 PSI. So pretty big difference. And this has an impact in two ways. One is if the tank manufacturer does not put enough steel in that tank, there is a possibility that it won't be strong enough to hold that liquid. And the other thing is, is when your automation device or your transmitter or whatever is, um, if it's spe specifically, if it's a, uh, if it's a differential pressure transmitter, and that is the device that's being used to, um, you know, figure out or, you know, transmit back the, the signal that's being used to calculate the, the amount of liquid that's in the tank, that has to be factored in. The specific gravity has to be factored in in the calculations that are going on with that. And if they're not, um, your liquid levels will be pretty far off from, from what they actually are. So some general installation um, and maintenance notes on these guys, um, this end suction pump. Um, the critical thing on this is alignment between the motor and the pump itself. And you see right in the middle of that pump, um, it's decoupled at the moment. Um, there's a coupler that will be installed um, typically in the field uh, when that's shipped. And if those two pieces aren't aligned very well, it will transmit vibration um, from one piece to the other piece. And that will almost always lead to failure on the mechanical seal which is the part of the pump that's keeping all the liquid inside of it. So once the seal fails, and I think everybody that's been around a treating plant in a pump like this um, can, can put their hand up and say, yes, I know what happens. There's a bunch of chemical that's leaking out. Sometimes it's spraying out, but it creates a mess everywhere. Um, it's a big maintenance issue. We don't like it. So if you can get ahead of it and align the pump correctly the first time and then not run it dry, then typically you'll get a longer life out of that seal. Um, oil, that's one that's sometimes overlooked quite a lot. Um, you know, on this pump, you'll notice, I don't know if you can see the mouse move or not, but down here is a visual um, indicator. It's, it's a clear, um, it, it, there's a clear cover on this piece and, and then what it's supposed to indicate is the oil level that's in this cavity for the bearings. Um, right on the top is a plug that is unscrewed so that oil can be put in. But you know, it's it's you know, there's there should always be some visible level in here. It should be somewhere around half halfway up um, in order to keep um, you know the bearings in this pump properly lubricated. Um, on a maintenance level for these types of pumps, these Grunfoss or the vertical multi-stage pumps. Um, 
the main thing that happens with these pumps is that small bits of debris can get in and pack into the impellers and because there's very tight tolerances going from each each level of the stacks and as that happens it starts to restrict flow and, and impedes performance you'll see that you know um, our pre the pressures that you're typically getting aren't quite there and the flow rates aren't quite there but I think the, the, the good thing about these is that you can actually take the motor off the top and then this whole stack assembly can pull out and then it can be cleaned and then there's a seal that's in this area you know between the um, um, you know the motor facing part and the in the pump facing part here um, and that seal is typically a lot easier to work on than the other pumps uh, the, the end suction pumps so from a maintenance standpoint, while it may be, you know, more maintenance to, um, you know, kind of keep it clean, it may require a finer strainer to keep some of that smaller debris out. When it does need maintenance, it's typically a little bit easier to work on than some than the insection pumps. So there is an advantage there. And I mentioned on the air diaphragm pump already that, um, you know, if it's if you don't have a flexible fitting hooked up to it, like a hose on the inlet and outlet, um, there's quite a lot of vibration in the system that can break rigid piping. Um, the other thing is, you know, you want to keep the air supply clean. So you want to have a filter, you know, you want to have a filtered air supply coming to it. And then if you get too much debris in the line and there's different types of, you know, you can, you can buy some of these pumps in, in different configurations and some of them have, um, you know, they're called maximum pass, which means that, you know, they can take bigger debris and pass them through. Um, but, you know, typically you'll see that, you know, if you're getting, you know, a good amount of dust or sawdust or something in there, you can plug them up, but it's pretty easy to take them apart and clean them. Um, our maintenance issues, you know, mainly we're dealing with cavitation running the pump dry on the in suction pump and when that happens um, if we're running it dry we create heat um, heat creates uh, friction friction um, will cause you know, your seal to fail quicker because um, if there's not fluid going through it uh, you know it, it tends to you know with that heat it warps it and then whenever fluid does come back in uh, it's not quite ever the same again um, you know cavitation um, there's a video that I was hoping to show and I think that um, Belinda and Sarah were going to try to work on getting it um, prepared but I think it'll have to happen after lunch but there's a really good YouTube video um, that I found that demonstrates the uh, um, you know what what cavitation is in a lines in a pump system and I think you'll all understand if I say it sounds like um, the pump is moving rocks through it and a lot of times you're going to hear that sound when you're when your pump is starting when your big pressure pump is just starting up and it has a lot to do with the fact that the pump is operating in a very suboptimal range right when it starts. The pump wants to run at a high pressure. And when it does not, when it's running at a low pressure and it's running, pulling a lot of fluid through, um, it's creating a lot of, uh, it's building a lot of vapor bubbles in the solution. And as those bubbles are collapsing back inside the impeller uh, housing, it's creating that sound. It's a little mini explosions that are occurring on the face of that impeller continuously until that cavitation stops and this is what happens um, this is what it looks like um, after that has happened for a very very long period of time so i've actually taken impellers out of pumps that look like that believe it or not and you know it'll still pump it's pretty amazing it won't pump very well but that impeller would still move fluid even with all those holes in it um, that's a pretty extreme example, but yeah, that does happen. And that is, you know, almost a hundred percent due to, um, cavitation and not, not corrosion.
So on the maintenance side from the mechanical seal, just uh, just some common things to help uh, you know extend the life of that uh, piece of equipment on your pump um, is not running it dry. Like I've said, um, we've mentioned the vibration on the seal um, due to misalignment. Um, this should be flush. That helps to keep the seal cool. Like I said, if it's you know if there is um, you know if 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 for whatever reason um, the fluid is 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 very hot. Um, you know, you can run flush lines in that uh, are hooked up to water lines that run cool fluid through, or a lot of people will just have um, process fluid circulating through there. And then proper installation, and it's a pretty tricky job. Um, it's not something that um, someone wants to just jump right into without doing some research. Fortunately, you know, in the world of YouTube, there's lots of instructional videos that show step by step how to install that. So. For, yeah, in these days, it's a lot easier to, um, you know, to, to just about anything watching a YouTube video, including mechanical seals, maintenance. So going into metering real quick here, um, you know, looking at you know, the, the typical devices that we use in in um, in the treating plants are flow meters and scales. So a flow meter will be an inline. A uh, metering device that uh, uh, goes in the pipeline and measures the flow as it's running through. Um, these devices have migrated from um, turbine meters, which were the little um, propeller devices that were would spin around in the pipe as the fluid went through, but sometimes got stuck and or maybe broke and had that, some maintenance issues. These have uh, um, kind of graduated into um, what we use now, which is a which is a clear tube device, which is an electromagnetic flow meter, um, which has a different operating principle, but has a higher degree of accuracy and a higher operating range. Um, for our toad and drum products, as I mentioned, um, these are these work really well on platform scales, and there's a high degree of accuracy when we meter by weight, especially with small volumes. Um, Scales and flow, flow meters these days now, um, I would say, are probably a little bit more, um, especially the electromagnetic kind. There are smaller, cheaper flow meters um, that do work on a turbine principle, um, but you know, less accuracy and um, higher maintenance. Um, example of a mag flow meter sizing chart just give you an idea of what I was talking about with the operating range. But um, if you look in the size column there and you look at inches, you can see that you know a one inch meter will essentially go from about handle a range of about two gallons a minute all the way to 18 gallons a minute. And then if you get up to a three inch meter, you have a range of sorry, I was looking from Sorry, I should have said two to 78. I was looking at GPM versus meters cubed per hour. So um, yeah, one inch meter gives you quite a lot of range. And so um, don't need to keep too many different sizes for a treating plant. You know, typically a one inch or a two inch or a three inch is gonna um, handle just about every different type of range that you need. Um, and then finally, just um, uh, something I usually mention here at the end, as far as uh, um, installation of butterfly valves. You know, butterfly valves are the primary valve that you find in a treating plant, especially in the larger pipe sizes. And you know, these valves over time will start to leak, um, usually around the stem. And um, you know, one thing I was taught years ago in a in a vendor seminar was that when valves leak around their stem, which is the part that comes out the top that inter, you know, inter, interfere, um, sorry, integrates with the, either with that, uh, um, the handle or that gear operator there, um, we typically think that the failure or the leak is happening right there at the stem, um, when in fact, most of the time it's happening at the bottom of the valve. And it, you know, when that part of the valve starts to fail, um, or it gets degraded, then fluid will start to seep in at the bottom stem, and then it works its way all the way around um, the side of the valve, the outside of the valve, and then comes out of the stem. And how I was taught to 
um, illustrate this, or you can see this illustration here, but how I was taught to put these vowels in was instead of putting them in with that um, stem at the 12 o'clock position, you put it in at the three o'clock or the nine o'clock position because doing that will prevent buildup of debris at the bottom of your valve. So I hope that's a clear illustration and I hope that makes sense. And that's the end of my presentation. There are no questions there, from the audience. No questions? Okay. No. Thanks, Rob. You're welcome. Uh, do we have a poll question? It looks like we do. Yes, sir. I'm getting ready to launch it now. Thank you. We are at 96% voted, 92% false. That is correct. Okay, let's take a lunch break. Uh, looks like we're running about 20 minutes ahead. So, <clears throat> Why don't we come back at 1230 Pacific time, which would be uh, 330 Eastern. And then we can try to finish up a little early today. Uh, Sarah and Belinda, you guys OK with that? Yes, sir, that should be fine. Belinda, do you agree? That's perfect. Thank you. OK. 12.30 Pacific. We'll see you then. Bye. All right, just to, Grady, real quick. Um, yep. uh, nobody leaves this meeting as we did last year. We, we took, we went off one session and came back on another session. We're keeping everything on this session. So we will continue right where we are in, at 12.30 or 3.30. Sounds great. See well, everybody. Thank you. Also, Bye. one quick question. Hold on just a second. Rob, are you still there? We had a question from the audience that came in late. Yeah, I'm here. Can you go over the valve install again on an angle? If you've got a slide or some kind of explanation for that, you could just send it to me an email and I'll forward it to the customer that's asking about it. Yeah, right there. Okay, perfect. Installation butterfly valves. Okay, that's good. Thank you, Rob. You're welcome. That's it for me for questions for at this time. Okay, thanks everybody. See you at 1230 Pacific. Sarah? Yes, ma'am. You want to go on Teams and talk about this rather than doing it here? Sure. Okay. All right.
afternoon panelists who weren't here with us earlier today. I just wanted to let you know that we're not going to start till 3.30 Eastern time, 12.30 Pacific. So um, give us about another five or so more minutes and we will do mic checks and um, video checks. Belinda, this is Terry. Did, um, hey. did we let April know? Because I think she- April's April. on. Oh, okay, April's on, okay. Yes, she is. Okay. And we and appreciate it. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. Okay, all right, I'll be back with you guys in about five minutes. Okay. Okay, everybody, what we want to do now is check your mics and your video. So um, let's start with April. Ah, perfect. Thank you so much for doing this for us. We really appreciate it. Like <laughs> You're welcome. So you can see me. I mean, my. We really appreciate it. <laughs> really, really no, problem. no problem. <laughs> Just, that was an easier to express. Okay, now what's going to happen when it's your turn is I'm going to give you control, which I'm going to do now. And then I want you just to play with the control just a little bit. Okay, swipe across your key, swipe across your, um, your computer with your mouse. 
and then you should be able to, okay, you're, you're, I don't even know why I'm telling you, you got it. All right, that's all I needed. All right, okay. thank you. You're good. Hey, April. Hey. Now. hey. <laughs> oh, that's We're Sarah. Gonna, we really yeah, Sarah. appreciate you filling in. Yeah. Um, nope. It gave me an excuse to work from home. <laughs> there you go. Good. Now, um, if as this is goes for all the panelists, when it's not your turn, go ahead and keep your microphone off and your video off so that it's there's not so many people on and it, that gets a little bit distracting for the viewers. So, David, let's give you a try, please. All right. Hey, perfect. Uh, All right. I probably need to comb my hair and trim my beard, but uh, <laughs> other than that. Uh, that is okay. That is okay. I swear in two and a half years, I haven't worn a stitch of makeup. Well, maybe twice in that in that time. So so we're even. There you go. All right. I'm going to give you control and okay. make sure that you're good. Just to scroll around a little bit and make sure everything works for you. Perfect. Yep. Okay, good, 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 good. All right. Now. Now who's, let's see, Ryan, you want to give it a try? Ryan, are you there? Yes, I'm here. All right, terrific. Can you put your camera on for me, please? Uh, 1245, yep, you're next. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, give me a minute. Uh, no problem. Okay, All perfect. Right. Okay, now I'm going to give you control to make sure that you can roll and scroll and everything is fine. Both so hands on the wheel? Both hands <laughs> on the wheel, or just one is good too. Perfect. How do I okay. go back? You don't have to. I'll take care of it. If so, then I, I. But what if I wanted to go back to a slide or whatnot? I'd still have to ask you to go back. <laughs> just go. No, just go the opposite. Are you using your track? No, I was using my mouse, as you mentioned. Oh. Mm -hmm. No, I can't go. In, in the middle, in the we using the track, the trackball in the middle. You should be able to go back. I'll be right back, Melinda. Okay. Where's the trackball in the that middle? Round. Don't you have um you have a you have a left mouse and a right mouse, right? In between, uh, don't you have that little rolly thing? Yeah. Yeah, that, that should that should take you back. Is it working? No, it's taking me forward. Try it scrolling the other the opposite direction. Oh, there it is. All right. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay, good question, by the way. All right, Thank I'm you. gonna take I'm gonna take control away from you. And right. um hey Becky, how you doing? Hey Belinda, how's it going? It's going good. All right, uh, you are the next to give it a try. Go ahead. You're going backwards. Yeah, I am. Sorry. That's okay. Just as long as it's working for you, that's what's that's all that matters. Okay, feeling comfortable then? Yeah, I'm good with it. I, okay, I'm sure good. if it doesn't work, you'll manage to somehow make it work for me. Yeah, if if it doesn't work for anybody, no one fret. I'll make sure that I I um scroll through the the presentations for you. So okay, we're good to go. So um uh I think Ryan is first up. So I'm going to go ahead and take myself off. And just as a reminder, everybody, um, when you're not presenting um, off camera and and uh, mics muted, please. And we will see everybody in about 10 minutes.
Okay, I'm back. Do you need me, Belinda? No, we're good to go until 3.30. Okay. Okay, all right. Thanks. See you in a minute. Mm -hmm.
Hey, Grady, can you hear me? I can hear you fine. All right, good, because I called in just to make sure it was all working. It's working. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Nice day here in Atlanta. It's a gorgeous day in Sacramento. I feel like spring is here. It's always beautiful in Sacramento. <laughs> Grady, before you get started, we have a couple of announcements. Um, Sarah, you want to go ahead and say what you need to say, and then um, and then we'll get started. So we'll be right on time. I'm sorry. Were you talking to me or Grady? I was talking to you. I said, "Hey, Sarah, <laughs> you want to go ahead? That's okay. You want to go ahead and make your announcement so we can get started on time? Sure. Okay. Thank you." You're welcome. Okay, everyone, I, I do apologize. We were not able to load Rob's cavitation video. So if you would like to view it on YouTube, you can email me for the link. And you should all have my information. But if you don't, it is Sarah, S-A-R-A-H dot C-L-O-N as in Nancy, T as in Tom, Z is in zebra at arczada.com. Thanks, Sarah. Anything else? That's all for me at the moment. The next time you hear from me is a question, or either I'm going to la launch the poll, poll question. Okay. Okay, let's get Thank going you. then. All righty, <clears throat> 12.30 on the dot. Well, welcome back to the second half of Arczada's 2022 West Coast Operators Seminar. Uh, Ryan Pessa will start out the second session, and Ryan is the Director of Government Relations for the Western Wood Preservers Institute. He's responsible for monitoring and responding to regulatory and legislative initiatives affecting the preserved wood industry in 17 Western states. Ryan has extensive background in legislative policy and communications. He has a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science, Science from California State University, Long Beach and a Master's of Arts in Political Management from George Washington University. Welcome, Ryan. Thank you, Grady. I guess we'll just jump right in. Thank you for having me, Arxada. Thank you, Grady, for inviting me back. Uh, Going to be giving you a West Coast update on some legislative and regulatory issues that you should all be aware of. The first objectives we've got, we've got five objectives and can talk about the human health water quality standards or criteria in Washington, uh, environmental task force in Oregon, California pesticide licensing exams, some California heavy duty vehicle inspections that you all should be aware of if you have any um, 18 wheelers in your uh, facility or utilize them. And then of course, Prop 65. Then we're going to be discussing legislative affairs, uh, what's happening with the treated wood waste disposal in California, as well as other bills that are going to be relevant to our industry in Arizona and in Washington. <clears throat> Jumping into our first issue, the human health water quality criteria. You can see it's got a long history and I've been working on this issue since I started working for Western Wood Preservers Institute. Some background, Ob the Obama administration uh, implemented some EPA policy for storm water criteria that was unattainable by the regulated community. The regulated community as a whole started in Washington, that is, uh, petitioned EPA, and that petition really got some traction when Trump came into office. Trump acknowledged our petition and our uh, request and uh, the petition request was quickly moved to the um, judicial arena as many environmentalists filed suit and 
um, the hearing of what the judge finally implemented was requiring EPA to resubmit attainable water quality standards. Now that Trump is in an office and uh, we've got the Biden administration, it's gonna be pretty interesting to see what they do propose. The um, Washington Department of Ecology has uh, about nine months to propose something and through our coalition, we've heard that there's gonna be something published in the April Federal Register. We're not too sure if it's gonna be a draft rule or the proposed rule. If it is a draft rule and it's published in April, they'll have another nine more months to finalize the rule. That's kind of the update on this. It is moving really slow. And uh, if Biden doesn't win the next election, we'll probably be back off into square two. So we'll see how it goes and hang on tight. <clears throat> the next subject is the Environmental Task Force. And when I completed these slides, I thought this was gonna be a regulation coming from Governor Kate Brown in Oregon. But I quickly realized after the Oregon legislature started eight days ago that this is a bill. So Kate, uh, Governor Brown has uh, asked the legislature to do a few things with the uh, Oregon Environmental Justice Task Force. And what her bill does, which is HB 4077, is it would create staff positions for this task force. It would also change the name of this task force to a council, which is extremely important. And so this council is now gonna have paid staff positions to do a lot of administrative things. And from my understanding and my uh, hesitation is to really push the needle and help them achieve objectives. And the objectives that they're looking to achieve is to develop an environmental justice mapping tool that will identify um, environmental boundaries on environmental justice communities, environmental health disparities, and identifying highly impacted areas. This map is gonna be required to be updated every two years and all natural resources agencies will have to consider this mapping tool when developing rules, policies, and programs. Uh, it's a pretty short session here in the Oregon legislature. So they've got just, uh, I think a little over a month now or a little under a month. The Oregon legislature has to conclude by March 7th, I believe. The next agenda item or objective is the California Pest Licensing Exam. The California Department of Pesticide Regulation has now made it a lot easier to take your online, to take your tests. It's a computer-based testing uh, that they've moved to and it's offered throughout the whole state. At, a, at specific testing centers. Both Idaho and Wa Washington currently is doing that. However, um, oh no. Washington's currently doing this as well as Idaho is moving towards this. And one that I think is going to be really impactful if you have an 18 wheeler as part of your facility and doing shipping to that extent is the, um, and please excuse my, uh, my mistake right here with the California pesticide licensing exam. That should really say California high heavy duty vehicle inspection. This is going to be a vehicle inspection program that's going to be implemented in three different phases. The first phase which will take place in January, so a little under a year. And um, the first phase is gonna require you to get registered, to get screened for um, your emissions, and of course, to pay some fees and stuff like that to get all registered. And the second phase isn't really a phase I would view it as, but six months later, you're supposed to be up and running and checked in and part of the program paid your fees and, had your emissions test. So it's kind of just a little marker. But after July 3rd or July 1st, 2023 is when you're gonna be required to, um, to comply with any roadside testing. They're gonna have roadside testing 
starting January 2024, and um, and D DMV registration holds. So the most important part about this is if you're if you have a big rig that's licensed out of state and you're not in the state of California, they're gonna still enforce these through um, computer monitored uh, computer operated cameras with um, with license plate scanners and the like. So even though your your big rig is not registered in California, through this program they're going to monitor and make sure that you're compliant with this program to even drive into the California boundaries. It's going to be a really impactful program. It's going to really change the dynamics of shipping in California. Excuse me, Ryan, we have a question. Yes. Will out of state drivers be notified automatically or is this up to the driver themselves and the company themselves to register? Um, I think it's going to be on the onus is going to be on the driver of the company because there's specific requirements for brokers or freight facilities and each of those that I'm looking at my notes would just be verified compliance before entering into contracts and then maintaining records of compliance documents, transactions, and agreements. That's for the freight contractor. Um, so I, I believe it's going to be the onus is going to be on the actress of the specific company to comply with these. Okay, thank you. The next objective is. Prop 65, this is a kind of a good update, is that currently the Prop 65 notices for um, wood preservatives and wood products has not changed. So everything you did last year and yesterday is still the same for this year and today. This, what you're seeing here is the um, current Prop 65 wood dust warning which does fall in, or which wood products does fall into this. If you are using a preservative, it would be best to probably state that instead of titanium dioxide, is to state the actual preservative being used. That's probably a little bit of a safer bet. The other thing to note is that um, the new preservative that's gonna be starting, coming online real soon, DCOI, DCOI is not a Prop 65 candidate. So if your facility is looking to use DCOI, you should not name it here into this area, given that it's not a Prop 65 candidate. I think when it, I shouldn't say if, but when it does become a Prop 65 candidate, I will be um, informing our treaters as well as ARGSADA that this uh, preservative is now a Prop 65 candidate. Other Prop 65 issues that I want you to be aware of is the changes around um, Prop 65 labeling that doesn't impact our industry again. It's specifically for Roundup. Uh, Roundup went to court a couple years back and the court found that um, it's a possible carcinogen and that really pushes back on California's requirements saying that um, it is known to the state of California to cause cancer. Well, the court has found something different for Roundup. And now um, OEHA is requiring Roundup have a very different Prop 65 warning, which goes against 35 years of rulemaking. It's pretty interesting, and I think the floodgates are opening as this gets litigated and other things get litigated. Maybe other Prop 65 warnings will change but at this point in time, the notices and warnings for Prop 65 have not changed for our industry. If you do not utilize or have utilized, I'd encourage you to use WWPA's Prop 65 notification, and you can reach out to Diane or Kevin. Their email addresses are listed. They've got a Prop 65 notification where you give them your clientele or your, your customer base, and they send out Prop 65 notices on your behalf. Any questions on Prop 65? Moving on, kind of a good update for the California new nicotinoids mitigation measures. 
a lot of states have been implementing mitigation measures for neonicotinoids. We, as a wood industry, use one neonicotinoid, specifically imidacloprid, culprit, for um, certain preservatives, not all. And uh, the Department of Pesticide Regulation is looking to implement new mitigation measures for all new nicotinoids. I've been following this rulemaking for quite some time. And the benefits of this rulemaking is that it's specific to the agricultural community and does not impact us. And it's so specific to tell farmers about when or how they should spray blooms, certain crops, which crops attract bees and such, which doesn't impact us. Um, so going to continue to monitor that and make sure it doesn't impact us, but the neonicotinoids will get to it in the other parts of this presentation and other state actions. Moving on to the big elephant in the room is California treated wood waste disposal. So December 31st, 2020, 2020, yeah, December 31st, 2020, the, it was the last day you could dispose treated wood waste in a composite lines landfill in California. There was a lull for about three to four months where there were no disposal options other than a hazardous waste landfill in California. And um, prior to this ending, we only had 45 landfills that would accept treated wood waste. Currently, we have 53 and counting. The departments and landfills have been looking to accept treated wood waste, which is a great win for our industry because disposal has been an issue. The requirements for the bill are really put on to WWPI or the wood preserving industry. And we need to update the Department of Toxic Substance Control on certain trends in our industry, as well as developing educational materials and outreach activities, which I've started to begin. We also have to maintain an internet website and um, Updated every so often, says every year as needed. And another requirement with AB 332 is a notice to California wholesalers and retailers. This isn't a new requirement. This has been on the books since 2011. AB 332 just re brought that to the brought that to the front front and center. It was not a new requirement, and um, it was a sticking point that the legislature really wanted to continue. So WWPI drafted the following notice. We've shared it with our members for feedback, and this is the final version that we have. If you do not have a copy of this or would like this as a JPEG file, please shoot me an email. My email is at the end, or ryan at wwpi.org. This needs to be on every shipment of treated wood waste, treated wood going into a wholesaler or retailer. We are working currently to finalize this website, twwdisposal.org, as it relates to the requirements I mentioned earlier. But this is a pretty streamlined um, notification. If I make it as a JPEG for anybody, you can put it on any invoice and such. There is no size requirement, so you can make it as big as or as small as you want. We are looking to have in the future just a little one-liner or maybe a little bit longer with the requirements here and then just directing people to go to the website so it won't be as big. But this is an important thing. Treaters should be using this now. If not, um, please reach out to me and I can help you get started. Legislative stuff, new nicotinoids, as I mentioned, California has been pushing some regulatory issues or regulatory, a regulatory front on new nicotinoids. But in the past, we've had a few bills pop up in Colorado, New Mexico, Arizona, Nevada, and Oregon. They're all color coordinated with the years here. So far in 2022, we have a bill that has popped up in Colorado that I'm currently working on. It hasn't been introduced and I'm hoping to settle all of our concerns before the bill gets introduced. And then we have another bill that has just been introduced in Arizona that bans the middle corporate, the sale and the use. Um, who knows what more is to come? I know Jeff Miller is working on a few in Tennessee. There's always some in Minnesota and in Michigan happening. So 
we'll see how that pans out, but this has been a hot topic issue for us. Bear with me, I'm trying to go through the slides and not go too fast. I didn't want to over skip over one of them. So Arizona, as I mentioned, introduced a bill that bans four pesticides, including the middle culprit. WWPI submitted a letter. I'm not concerned with this bill at all because the bill author, Senator Mendoza, or Mendez, has introduced a very similar bill in prior years. He's a Democrat and the legislature is controlled by Republicans. So the bill didn't get a, a hearing in the legislature. And I'm pretty sure that's gonna happen again this year. But good to know and keep an eye on it. A hot button issue is environmental product declarations. Washington state last year had something similar that uh, their goal is to really reduce greenhouse gas emissions from building materials. And they thought they could do that with uh, Senate Bill 5659. And what the bill requires is um, supply chain specific issue, specific data for um, anything that contributes to 80% more of the greenhouse gas emissions for public works projects. And I've made this summary specific to composite lumber and mass timber, because that's what is defined or mentioned specifically in the bill. Other building materials that are mentioned in the bill are concrete, steel, and, um, and plastics. So the good news about this bill is it's not moving. Industry, the building materials industry as a whole in Washington is opposed to this and opposed to the prior bill last year. Both were somewhat of um, active candidates to move through the legislature and they have a deadline of this week to move forward or the rest of the session they'll be dead. Uh, I anticipate both will die and that we're gonna have to have more in-depth conversations with the bill sponsors and the affected stakeholders of the environmental product declarations. So we'll see how that pans out, but at this point in time, this isn't something to worry about. I do think that this could be good for our industry because we've got a great story to tell with, as far as carbon emissions and greenhouse gas compared with other, um, other materials. Kind of went through that quicker than I anticipated. Let the there's my information to shoot me an email if you want the um, manufacturer's notice for treated materials coming into wholesalers or retailers, as well as if you want any information on the other bills that I've mentioned or regulatory issues I've mentioned. But since I ended pretty quickly, just kind of check back in with uh, headquarters to see if there's any questions coming in. I don't have any that have come in so far, Ryan, but if you'll be on for a few minutes, there may be some that yeah, come. Yeah, definitely. Okay, thank I can, you. I can sing in the meantime if everyone wants to hear me sing. Okay, that'd be great. No, I'm just <laughs> Do we get to choose what you sing? <laughs> that'd be great. Yeah, me and Belinda will do backup for you. <clears throat> Okay, Sarah, make it fun, Sarah you know. is a backup singer. You do not want me to sing anything ever. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Ron. Appreciate that. Appreciate it. I'll stay on for a little bit longer and uh, see if any questions do come through. Um, or at least stay on with the video. And then um, if anything does come through, I'll answer them. But I'll uh, be here for the remainder of the session. So thank you for having me again. Thank you, Ryan. Thanks, <clears throat> Ryan. Our next speaker is uh, Terry Moko, and Terry uh, joined Arxada in 2014 and now serves as Senior Manager of Regulatory Affairs Americas. Terry has nearly 30 years of regulatory experience with wood preservatives. <clears throat> Her responsibilities include securing and managing pesticide registrations in the Americas and ensuing compliance with all applicable pesticide regulations in these in this region. <clears throat> Terry is a longtime participant of the American Chemistry Council, Five Sides Panel, and Panel Task Forces. Terry is chair of the Arsenical Wood Preservers Task Force and an active member of the Antimicrobial Exposure Assessment Task Force. 
and the Copper Task Force. She's a busy lady. Terry has a Bachelor of Arts degree from State University of New York in Communications and Political Science. Terry will be talking to us about pesticide labeling and PPE requirements. Welcome, Terry. Hello. Um, welcome, everybody. My topic this afternoon is pesticide labeling, and I know you've probably thought, oh no, I have to sit through this again, but unfortunately, it is one of the core um, requirements to uh, in order to get your um, credits for your license. So uh, here we go. I did try to, uh, I am going to try to, to change it up a little bit today. So. Okay, today um, in the pesticide labeling, we're going to talk about um, what is a pesticide label and the relationship between the label and the product registration and what causes labels to be revised, which is something I don't think we've touched on in the past. It, it, um, you know, labels don't always stay the same, so why do they change? And what changes in labeling should we expect soon? First, there's two terms you'll hear when people refer to pesticide labels. They, people will mention label and they'll mention labeling. Well, the label is what you typically think of in terms of it's the, the image or in the language and in which in the actual, what we would consider a label that's attached to your product packaging. If it's a tote, it would be on your tote. Um, your tanks, your storage tanks would have product labels on them and you should be receiving them with, um, the truck driver should be leaving a label when they deliver the product to you at your, um, at the treating plant. But that's what we refer to as the label. But the term labeling also includes not only this product label, but other items that would accompany the product when it's delivered to you, whether that be an SDS or a, in the case of the arsenicals with CCA and ACZA, we have the supplemental labeling um, or any printed material that would accompany the product, that's referred to as labeling. And EPA does regulate both the label and the labeling that would be associated with a registered pesticide product. Now I mentioned EPA, and that's because all pesticide products are registered by the US Environmental Protection Agency, specifically the Office of Pesticide Programs. As a registrant, if we want a new product to be able to distribute to our customers, we would submit an application for registration to EPA with all the required data um, in a necessary forms and a draft label. Data could include toxic, acute toxicity data. It can would definitely include product chemistry, physical and chemical characteristics data, an explanation of how the product is made, the starting materials. Um, all that information is, is then provided to EPA with results in the language that you'll find on your label. Now, EPA will assess the information you provide them to determine if there's any unacceptable risk. If there are not, they will grant the registration. So really the label that you see, the pesticide product label, is the visual representation of this registration. It's the representation of all the information that has been provided to the agency in order to receive approval for that product registration. Now, unlike other products you may purchase um, and have uh, you know, around your house, the pesticide labels are legally enforceable. And that's why any pesticide product label Right above the directions for use, you will see the statement, it's a violation of federal law to use this product in a manner inconsistent with its labeling. And that's because the label, as we, in, we refer to as the label is the law. Any um, violation of the directions for use, the, the methods of application, the application rates, the, the failure to comply with anything that's stated on that product label would be considered an offense and punishable by law. So 
So I mentioned a draft label being submitted as part of the pesticide registration application. Um, so what information is needed to draft a pesticide label? And when I go to draft a label, which is one of my responsibilities when I submit an application for registration to EPA, and, and I gather all the information I have on the product that we want to register, and I prepare a draft label. Most importantly, I need to know the active ingredients and the percentage in the composition, because we have to have an ingredient, ingredient, excuse me, ingredient statement on the product label. I need to know the results of those acute toxicity tests I mentioned, because depending on the results of those tests, it will determine the signal word that's on your label. Is it gonna be a caution, a warning, or a danger? And based on the results of those acute toxicity tests, and the signal word, which determines the tox classification, that will also influence precautionary language that shows up on your label, such as, um, you know, danger, you know, harmful if inhaled, or any of that type of language in under your precautionary language is based on the acute toxicity test results. And also it will influence the personal protection equipment requirements that are on the product label. Physical and chemical characteristics data that I mentioned is submitted as, as part of the application package. What's the flashpoint? Do we need to put flammable on the product? What's the ingredients, the composition? Is it an oxidizer? Do we need to make a, um, put a warning on the label in regards to an oxidizer? Um, there are certain ingredients in the composition that will require you to mention it on the label. For example, um, any product that you receive that contains sodium nitrite, it will state that on the label that this product contains sodium nitrate um, right in the area of the um, ingredient statement. So all that information you're providing will influence the language on your label. Intended use sites. Um, is this an anti-sapsane product um, used for surface control? Is it a pressure treatment product? Um, is it both? You know, what are the intended use sites of this product? How is it going to be applied? Is it by pressure treatment only? Can you also apply it by dip or spray? All that information needs to be on the label, including your rates of application. An individual must be able to read that label and know exactly how to use the product, how to stay safe using that product, and, and to make sure that it's used in a manner that it's intended for. Information such as container size is, uh, I need to know that when I draft a label because the storage and disposal statements on each product label will have, um, if it's a refillable container, will have triple rinse instructions. And, and you may not notice because you, you, you typically handle bulk product or you handle uh, totes, but the triple rinse instructions change depending on the size of the container. You'll have different instructions for a container less than five gallons than you will for a container greater than five gallons. And then, you know, and then a bulk container would have different um, container handling instructions. So all that information has to be gathered and goes into drafting a pesticide label. Now there's different types of product labels. Um, ones that you don't typically, you would not see um, it, as an end user are your technical actives or in your manufacturing use product labels. Because these are the labels for the products, for the technical actives and, and the manufacturing products that are used then to formulate the end use products that you see at the treating plants. For example, um, it, when it comes to CCA, we have um, our, our wood protection has a registration for arsenic acid. That's going to be a manufacturing use product label. We have a label for chromic acid registration. We have one for copper oxide, but those will have simply state that they need to be used, they're used to formulate a wood preservative. So you won't see those labels, but all the technical actives that you see in pesticide products would have their own label to be used at a manufacturing site location. But then what you see is an end use product label. And it specifies all the things we just talked about on the previous slide, you know, the site of application, the rates, your PPE, the, the PPE instructions are not going to be on the um, technical active labels, the manufacturing use product labels, like they will be on the end use product labels. So you, if you saw two of them side by side, you can tell the difference between the labels, but the 
these are the different types of product labels um, associated with registrations. Now, parts of the pesticide product label will go into a little here. Um, the primary panel, and for we try um, to format all, all our labels in the same template. And the primary panel would be the center panel of our product labels. That's where you'll find your restricted use statement, right at the very top of the center panel, if it's a restricted use product, such as CCA or ACZA. Um, below it will be the product name, followed by the ingredient statement. The child hazard warning statement, keep, keep away from children. Then you'll have your signal words. Is it a danger or a warning, warning or a caution? Um, in the case of um, the arsenical products, and you also have the skull and crossbones symbol and the word poison. We also, for most of our labels, I would say there may be a few exceptions that we also have our first, um, the first aid statement will be at the primary panel, but um, we usually have the net contents also in the primary panel, but I think there may be a couple that the net contents may be elsewhere. But you'll find, uh, definitely to find the first aid statement in the primary panel. This is an example of the restricted use pesticide uh, statement that you'll find on products that have been classified as restricted use pesticides and, and the reason most of you are attending today's seminar. Um, and the reason that product would be classified as a restricted use pesticide is uh, the agency has found that the toxicity exceeds certain hazard criteria and therefore they've classified it as a restricted use. What they're saying is they feel that this product has properties that require it to be handled um, more regulated in the terms of way it's being handled. And one way to do that is to make it restricted use, to make sure that the people are handling this product, um, are trained and are licensed. And, and that's their way of saying, okay, we can allow the product to still exist, you can still have the registration, but we want to make sure there's some more control on the use and application of this product. And that's why they would make a product restricted use. Secondary panels of the labels would include your precautionary statements, your hazards and humans to domestic animals, your environmental health hazards, your physical and chemical hazards, um, personal protective equipment requirements, um, Skull and crossbones symbol and the word poison, that um, I believe that's an error that should be on, that's on your primary panel. But um, directions for use and storage and disposal statements um, would also be on your secondary panels. Typically, the, the way our labels are set up that you'll find the um, directions for use and storage and um, disposal statements are typically found on the uh, right hand column and then the um, then you have your primary panel in the center, and then you have, would have your precautionary statements and, and hazards and PPE requirements on the left-hand side of the label. So now I wanna talk a little about um, pesticide label rev revisions. And um, why does a pesticide label change? And we like to think of the fact that a pesticide label is something that is um, kind of like a living document it, it always is subject to change. And that's important to know because you, you can't just assume that it will always stay the same. Um, we try to inform you if there's a change in a product label to, and we bring those changes to your attention. Um, if they are of a substantial change that would require you to change something at the treating plant. Um, but the change, these labels have changed many times over the years. And so why would it change? Um, and, and for multiple reasons, they could be either a change that we've initiated and we've decided that we want to make a change to the label, or it could be revised because EPA or state agency regulating pesticides has told us we need to make a change in that label. And a change that could be registrant initiated would be if we had a label that we wanted to add or delete new use sites, um, we want to change an application rate. Sometimes we want to um, increase it or, or decrease the lower rate. Um, if we want to add or delete application methods, for example, maybe we had a label that was just pressure treatment and we want to add a, a spray or a dip use to that label. 
we want to add or revise mix instructions. Um, there are some labels that have mix tables that we may need updating. We may want to add more mix tables. We want may want to change the the rates in which the product um, the ratio of products in terms of a mix. So those are things that we as as registrants would go to EPA and request approval for those changes. But then EPA may require changes um, because of a result of a policy or a rule change, or in, in what we'll talk about a little later as a result of an agency review of either an active or a group of products. Well, it's not currently a, a common practice. What EPA has done um, in the past is they've issued what they call a pesticide registration notice or a PR notice to initiate changes on product labels. This was done back in 2001 for the first aid statements. Um, in 2007, when um, all the container handling statements changed on product labels and disposal instructions. Um, and in 2017, for more ag-related um, products, they, they used a PR notice. And what they would do with this, with a PR notice, they would issue this document and say, everyone that has this type of product or label, that if you're subject to this change, everyone has to change it by a certain date, which is something I, I prefer because then everyone's on a level playing field in terms of, for example, um, competitors and, and similar products within an industry. Everybody's making the same change at once. Um, I prefer this over uh, what's become more common is where EPA is doing things on a case-by-case -case basis, which then could perhaps require one registrant to make a change before another one. And, and that can be cause problems if, if the change may make one product more attractive than the other. But um, the PR notices was a, a way that they, they did handle changes that were impacting all product labels. And that way everyone was able to to get them revised and by a certain date at the same time. So we mentioned review processes, and, and I think you've, you've heard before that EPA for the past 15 years almost has been doing a, what they call a registration review, and that's where they're reviewing actives um, registrations. Actually, uh, these the registration process for this review process is supposed to be completed um, by the end of this year, and uh, that's not going to be happen. Um, but actually, because after this will be the end of the first 15-year review cycle, then there will be another 15-year review cycle where they look at all the active, uh, again, in terms of um, the risks that they propose and if any changes need to be made um, to products containing those active ingredients. So um, right now, in the registration review process, the agency has 172 total cases that they've been looking at. Um, about 20% have wood preservative use patterns, and only about 3% are solely wood preservatives. And the way this registration review process is set up is the agency will issue what they call a preliminary work plan for comment. And, and there are various points along this overall process where the public can comment and registrants can have some communication with the agency um, in regards to their plans. Uh, the preliminary work plan, there will be a comment period. Then a final work plan is issued. When I say a work plan, it's where EPA says, this is how the, an active ingredient is used. These are the, um, this is the data we have to assess this product. This may be some data that we'll need in the future. And this is a time schedule for how we think this review process is gonna go for this particular actum. Now, if they did determine that they needed data to make further assessments of this product, then they would issue a data call-in, which would be a notice sent out to all registrants who contain a, a product with that active ingredient saying, we need you to supply you know, this study, or, or it could be a number of studies. Um, Typically, when that occurs, registrants of the technical actives, which I mentioned earlier, you know, if you have a technical active, for example, like arsenic or, or chrome or, or copper, like we do, you would typically get together with other registrants of actives and you would share in, in producing that data together. It doesn't make sense for multiple registrants to do uh, 
study. You don't want to end up with you know multiple studies being generated that have conflicting results because that's not good. So typically task forces are formed and data is generated and supplied to the agency. And then the agency will look at that data and they'll do risk assessments. They'll do human health risk assessments and environmental risk assessments. And Becky's gonna talk about those a little later on. Um, once they do these risk assessments, they will issue what they call a draft risk assessment. And um, there's another comment period. Registrants can review, we can agree, disagree, we can say, hey, you know, you didn't look, take this into consideration, or, or you used, you know, you know, what we consider old data, or, or you know, we think you should do this or that. That would be part of our comments. Um, and then once we submit those comments, the agency issues a proposed interim final decision, which we refer to as a PID, that says, okay, this is like the, this is how we looked at it. This was our we gathered from the draft risk assessment. We feel the product can continue to be registered or not? You know, are there uses that we feel need to be eliminated or not? And, and potential label changes that would be required in the future. Again, another public comment period, and then an interim decision or an ID is, is issued. And this, at that point, um, it has the final, it's, even though it's referred to as interim decision, um, that's the point in which then registrants have to start revising their labels and make any changes that have come out of this assessment that the agency has conducted. This is um, a list of some of the active ingredients that um, relative to wood preservation that the agency is looking at. Um, and, and what we'll talk about in a second here is if you see at the bottom there, the, the pentachlorophenol, the chromated arsenicals, which includes CCA and ACCA, in creosote, um, it, the time that this table was created, the agency had anticipated issuing the ID um, at the end of the year. They actually wrote it and signed off on it. Um, it just was released to the public this past Friday. Um, it, it takes, there's always a bit of a delay between the time they sign off on it and it becomes released to the public because you have to find time to, the, the agency has to have a, a spot to have it published in the federal register. You also see too that the, the different actors are in different phases. Um, draft risk assessment was issued for the um, for the azoles and um, DCOI, uh, and they anticipate um, the PID. So they're there. They haven't issued the PID yet. Where the heavy duty wood preservatives, they've already issued the ID. So everything's in a, in a different time schedule. But um, the goal is to try to have everything completed by the end of this year, with the exception of the ITs, which DCOI is part of. Um, in part of this review process, what EPA does to assess risks to, human, to exposure to humans in the environment, they'll, um, as I said, they'll, they'll then want to mitigate those risks. If they feel that there's, for example, um, an inhalation exposure, they may say that that is unacceptable, then they will come up with perhaps process changes or PPE requirements to mitigate that. So we've had in terms of the industry and uh, the chromated arsenicals have had a, a number of conversations with the agency prior to them issuing the ID this past Friday to try to propose and in the risk mitigation that we feel would um, alleviate the risk but at the same time, not be a burden on to our customers. Um, and let's see here. Um, once the uh, ID was issued, which as I mentioned was on Friday, we have 60 days now from publication to submit revised labels to uh, EPA based on the decisions of this document and, and the proposed, um, excuse me, and, and the required label changes. And um, once we have those, I think it's April 5th, um, I need to have revised draft labels uh, for ACCA and CCA into the agency. They will then uh, review them. And I think they're giving themselves about six months to, to get back to us. Um, once they approve those final, those labels, then I need to submit them to all the states and update those labels with the state agencies. Um, and, and then once all the states, and specifically California, 
um, because that usually takes the longest. Once they've approved of the revised label, then you'll start seeing that revised label uh, on product that gets uh, delivered to your site and you'll also get new um, tank labels. But it, as you can tell, it's gonna take a while. Like I said, we don't even need to have our, we won't get our revised labels into the agency until April and by the time they get back to us, I wouldn't expect you to see revised labels at your site until end of this year, probably first quarter of next year. Um, at the earliest. Yeah, a lot depends on how quickly EPA gets back to us uh, on the labels we submit to them. Um, there's some things, there's some language um, that EPA is, is requiring of all wood preservers going through the review process. Um, there, you know, specific language that they want us to make sure we specify the application methods and, and clear on what wood commodities are, can be treated with the preservative. Um, if you're making a termite claim, they want you to put the minimum target retention needed for that termite claim. Um, they want maximum application rates on labels. Um, any reference to uh, AWPA must also include the, uh, the version of the AWPA standard specifically we're referencing. Um, and this is being required across the board for all wood preservative labels and not specific just to CCA and ACCA. Um, and before we get into questions, I did want to, and I apologize just because it came out so uh, close to the seminar that it wasn't included in the presentation. Um, I was just going to let you know that the one, um, in regards to the registration review and what was released on Friday, uh, EPA's concerns were with respiratory protection for when, um, performing certain tasks. And because of that, they are requiring some additional PPE requirements. And there's also a proposal for process changes in regards to that ventilation step um, at the end of the, the charge. Um, one of the things that we did as, as part of mitigation steps with the agency is they wanted, they came back with one proposed uh, way of, of process change and, and we said you know one size doesn't fit all for all our customers you know our customers vary in, in terms of their operation so we actually um are going to be able to put uh epa agreed and, and we have um more than one change that can be made to um for our process change um and that's going to be on the label and uh another change in terms of ppe um, there's going to be a list of, of tasks and it will say, if you perform these tasks, then this is the PPE you must wear. Um, and so there's a, a couple different steps there. We tried to make it so it wasn't like a, a one size fits all for, for everyone working at the plant. Um, and the other thing is, and um, was the no, one of the statements we do have to put on the label is there um, no dry sweeping of the drip pad. I don't think that's a common practice, um, but there's been a case where it, it was seen when we were doing some worker exposure studies and EPA was aware of that. So um, I don't think that's going to be a, a hardship for the, for the plants, but we do have to put down on the label that um, it, that there's no dry sweeping and then if steam cleaning the drip pad workers must wear appropriate PPE um, as described elsewhere on the label. So that's just some of the things that you'll see. As I mentioned, um, I don't expect you to be able to get those labels until end of this year or beginning of next. Um, but And we will send out information prior to that to give everyone uh, a heads up and, and what will be required. And in regards to the process change on the ventilation step, um, the statement on the label is that um, plants will have until January 31st, 2024 to initiate that change. So that will be, you have time to plan for that and see which step actually um, works best for, for your site. But uh, again, um, this information just came out Friday, but we'll have, we'll be following up with all our customers. So any questions? I don't have any questions that came in, Terry. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have a question at this point? Sarah, there it is. 
I don't see it. Oh, question number four is there. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm looking at the board where the audience sends in questions. I apologize. Let me launch. The oh, now. <laughs> <sighs> Okay, we're at 96% and 92% is true. Okay, uh, thank you. Good job, everyone. Our next uh, presenter is, is new to the uh, group and uh, her first presentation, and her name is April Hines, and April is the Regional Environmental Health and Safety Manager overseeing our Conley, Kalama, and Valparaiso plant locations. In her position, she supervises environmental compliance, industrial hygiene, risk assessment, and behavior-based safety programs. April has her Bachelor of Science degree in Environmental Science and her Master's degree in Occupational Health and Safety and Environmental Management. And April will be speaking to us about PPE requirements. Uh, Michael, by the way, uh, is in jury duty today, so he couldn't make it. April, welcome. Thank you. All right, let's see. All right, I have, make sure that was the first slide. It's going a little slow. Okay. All right. So I'm just going to discuss um, some types of PPE. Um, there are regulations um, in the OSHA standard 29 CFR 1910 subpart I um, personal protective equipment. And there's individual um, standards within that that addresses um, hand protection, foot protection, electrical protective devices, head, respiratory, and then general protection. So we're going to discuss hard hats, eye and face protection, respiratory protection, hand protection, and foot protection. So um, hard hats, um, we have the class G, which protects against impact, penetration, um, and good for low voltage electrical protection, less than 2200 volts. Class E um, would be um, electrical um, hard hats designed for electrical utility work, uh, protects against falling objects, impact, um, electrical protection against very high voltage, greater than 20,000 volts. And then you have your Class C, which is conductive. Um, that's just designed for comfort, offers limited protection, uh, protects against bumps, um, does not protect against falling objects or electrical hazards. So based on um, your task at your job and the hazards, um, you would need to select the appropriate hard hat for that um, environment. So your eye protection, um, your general eye protection will be your safety glasses. That's your safety glasses with um, side shields um, that provides moderate impacts from particles. Um, and then your safety goggles protect eyes and facial area from impact, dust, and splash. Um, so, you know, because your safety glasses is just general protection, you know, whenever there is a chance for um, exposure to chemical splash hazards or dust, um, you want to go with the safety goggles there. 
Then going in your face protection again, you have your face shields. Um, protects the face from nuisance, dust, and potential splashes or sprays of hazardous liquids. Um, this does not act as eye, eye protection. Uh, to protect your eyes, you want to also wear safety glasses or goggles underneath that face shield. Um, and then respiratory protection. Um, there's different types of respiratory protection. You have your air purifying respirators that remove contaminants from air, your supplied air respirators that provide clean or breathable air. Um, the facility must also have a written respiratory protection program if respira respirators are used in your area. Um, and then that medical evaluation of fit test must be performed prior to your respirator use. Um, and also with your medical clearance, sometimes your doctor will give you clearance for one year, two year or five year, you know, make sure you're evaluating um, that information and performing those medical evaluation as required um, from the occupational physician prior to performing that fit test as well. Um, so there's some other items under the respiratory protection standard, which is in um, 29 CFR 1910 134 um, that you want to consider, such as the applied protection for factor that determines how well a respirator or filter combination will protect you uh, from respiratory hazards, as well as your maximum use concentration, um, which is the upper limit, which the class of respirators expected to provide that protection. Um, so that is very important when you're dealing with chemicals that have like an IDLH or immediately dangerous to life and health um, hazard. Hand protection. Um, so you have different types of gloves, and this is important because not all gloves are good for all chemicals. Um, so these are some different types of gloves here. You have your anti-vibration, chemical resistant gloves. Um, that could be like your butyl rubber, nitrile, latex, neoprene, viton gloves, um, silver shield gloves, depending on the chemical, leather palm gloves. Um, permeation resistant gloves, heat resistant, and then cut resistant gloves as well. Um, anytime you're using sharp objects, even when you're in an office environment cutting through boxes, you should always use a cut resistant glove as well. Um, so knowing your hazard will also tell you the type of glove you need to wear, um, especially when you're dealing with different chemicals. You always want to look in um, section eight of that SDS to determine um, the right type of glove. Um, so most safety data sheets will tell you um, the type of glove you need to use, whether it's nitrile or butyl rubber or neoprene, it'll actually state that. Um, foot protection, um, those are your um, safety toed shoes, um, composite or steel toe. Um, those are required in areas where there's a danger of foot injuries due to falling or rolling objects. Um, shoes with metal toe cap protects against falling or rolling objects. And then rubber shoes protect against chemical materials. So you also have the option of the rubber boots that also have the um, safety toe for impact hazard as well. Um, those are really good against protection against um, chemical and um, rolling objects. Um, some protective clothing, you have your general protective clothing, which would your first line of defense, of course, is your uniform or your shirt and your pants. But um, in addition to that, your laboratory coats provide some type of protection as well. Coveralls, um, that could be um, just general coveralls um, that you would put on your rec over your regular clothing. Vests, jackets, aprons. Um, there's different types of aprons as well, um, like Tyvek aprons, of course, so that's just good for like particulates. And then they have Tykem aprons as well, that's good for more liquid contact. You have surgical gowns, and then you have your full body suits. Those would be those Tyvek suits or Tykem suits um, that you can wear as well. Um, so normally, again, section eight of your safety data sheet will, will tell you based on that chemical hazard, what type of protective clothing you would need to wear um, to handle that chemical. So your OSHA safety data sheet versus your EPA label. So both your safety data sheet and your EPA label will list PPE requirements. Um, and sometimes those requirements will be different. So which one should you follow? So for any registered products, um, the EPA label does take precedence over that OSHA safety data sheet. Um, any unregistered product, you, you would want to follow the safety data sheet or the um, GHS label. Uh, make sure you read and follow all of those label instructions 
um, because it gives the PPE requirement based off the different types of tasks as well that you may be performing while handling that chemical. Uh, so for example here, we have the uh, Womanese CAC. Um, in this section that circled here, you have your personal protective equipment. Um, so this is gonna tell you exactly what you need to wear when handling this chemical. Um, so for applicators and other handlers, they must wear coveralls over long sleeve shirt and long pants, socks and chemical resistant footwear, goggles or face shield, chemical resistant gloves, um, some materials that are chemical resistant to this product are barrier, lam laminate or Viton gloves. Um, and then you have when mixing and loading, also wear a chemical resistant apron. Um, so that's gonna tell you exactly um, what type of PPE is required during which task. Then um, your woman concentrates 60%. You have um, the PPE listed here. I'll try to read that, it's very small, but um, so we have different tasks here listed. It'll say all personnel handling treated wood or handling treating equipment, including poles, hooks used to retrieve charge that has come in contact with preservative must wear the following PPE. So it has that washable or disposable coveralls, chemical resistant gloves and socks plus industrial grade safety work boots with chemical resistant soles. And then the next section, anyone that's rinsing or maintaining the treatment cylinder, gasket equipment, or working with concentrate or wood treatment preservative must wear the following PPE. So you have your PPE for that specific task as well. Well, um, And then the last part, in the event of equipment malfunction or door spacer placement, all personnel within 15 feet of the um, cylinder opening prior to ventilation must wear the following PPE. So that's why it's important just to read through all of those requirements because there are different PPE requirements based on specific tasks while handling that chemical. All right, and then OSHA also has a PPE guide. Um, this is actually available um, by download. Um, it can also be ordered if you want it in an actual copy from, the, from OSHA, um, but it pretty much tells you the type of PPE um, and different types of PPE based on that regulation. You know, for example, they have um, this guide in this table here. It'll tell you for specific chemicals, what types of gloves are good for that chemical. Um, there's other charts as well out there that you can use, um, but just like we said, no glove material is good for all chemicals. So if we take one of these chemicals here, let's say um, cyclohexanol here, and then we see the neoprene, that's a good, the rating is good for use with cyclohexanol, and we go over to latex rubber, that is fair. Um, go over again, um, butyl gloves are, are good, and then nitrile is very good use. So looking at this, I would select to use nitrile gloves if I'm working with cyclohexanol, just because um, the breakthrough and the barrier provides the best protection. So again, the copies of the OSHA PPE guide are available. Um, you can actually download it right from the OSHA site. Um, always use at least the minimum PPE required by that product label. Um, and then again, if it's unregistered or other chemicals, you're gonna follow that safety data sheet. Um, and then our side of personnel, we're always available to assist you with PPE selection um, if needed. Oh, does anyone have any questions? I don't have any questions so far, April, but they could come in. So we may cover it okay. or get a question for you on your next one. All right, no problem. Thank you. All right, so you want me to go ahead and continue then? Grady, do you want her yes. to continue? Yes, go ahead and continue. Okay, so now I'll go into um, hazardous waste management. Um, so what's going to be covered in this section is just general hazardous waste requirements. 
um, what you have to do to comply with these regulations, accumulation of hazardous waste, inspections, programs, and then reporting. Um, and then we'll go over some of the generator improvement rules that were um, issued. So new requirements in this presentation, um, they will be emphasized in green and we'll go over some of those improvement rules. All right. So general hazardous waste requirements. Um, so there's three categories. Um, you have your very small quantity generator. Um, that was part of the generator improvement rule where um, it used to be conditionally exempt small quantity generator. Um, now they're called very small quantity generators and they just generate less than 220 pounds in a calendar month. Um, we still have small quantity generators. They generate more than 220 pounds, but less than 2,200 pounds in a calendar month. And then your large quantity generators um, generate 2,200 pounds in a calendar month there. Okay. All right. So um, other general hazardous waste requirements. So if you treat with regulated chemicals such as CCA, Penta, Creosote, or ACZA, um, your drip pad is subject to hazardous waste management and subpart W standards. Um, the waste that accumulates on that drip pad is identified by hazardous waste code F035. It is a listed waste. Um, since it is residual material on the drippage that contains um, inorganic preservatives that have arsenic and chromium in them. So there are some requirements on drip pad. So you can accumulate hazardous waste um, on site without a permit or without having interim status provided that the waste on the drip pad maintains, um, you have proper records, you have a description um, of your procedures, and then you have documentation um, that the unit is emptied every 90 days. So some common hazardous waste disposal methods, um, recycling and recovery, um, sometimes we're using it for fuel, um, incineration of that waste, underground injection, um, disposing it, of it in a landfill. Um, any waste disposed from a drip pad is normally treated with some type of binding agent such as cement um, to reduce leachability of those metals and then it is placed into a hazardous waste landfill um, after treatment. So some accumulation standards and what we have to do to comply with those regulations. Um, so you have your two types of hazardous waste storage units. Um, they have their own unique requirements. We'll go through each one individually. So you have your central accumulation areas and your satellite accumulation areas. So your central accumulation areas, um, those are really for your 90 day, your 180 day uh, waste storage. So any drums in your central accumulation area, they have to have a hazardous waste label on them. The drums must be closed they must include an accumulation start date. They also have to be labeled to identify the hazards of the waste. Um, you can do that by a DOT placard or GHS pictogram. Um, any drums um, in that central accumulation area, they cannot exceed the certain storage time restrictions. For So for a large quantity generator, it's 90 days. Once you have that accumulation date on there, you have to dispose of that material within 90 days. Uh, for a small quantity generator, it will be um, 180 days. All right, uh, for satellite accumulation areas, so there's no time restriction during accumulation at a satellite um, for a satellite drum. Those drums must be closed. A satellite container, it doesn't always have to be a drum. It can be some other type of um, container in that area but it cannot exceed 55 gallons at any accumulation point. Um, also must be generated, uh, it must be at the point of generation. Um, so it may not be near a central accumulation area. You can generate that waste in another area um, and then collect it in a central accumulation area um, once that um, container is full. So the satellite container must also have the words hazardous waste on them. It must also identify the hazards um, of the contents. So you can use a DLT placard as well or some type of um, pictogram. So once a satellite accumulation 
um, container is full, you, you add the start date to the label and then move that container to the central accumulation area within three days. So inspections, um, there are a lot of inspections that are required as a part of these regulations. Um, you have your drip pad inspections, your sump inspections, hazardous waste container inspections, cease drippage, and then your drip pad certifications. So for your drip pad certifications, um, these should be conducted weekly. And then if your drip pad is not covered after any um, storm event as well. Um, you're gonna look for deterioration, malfunction, improper operation of runoff or runoff systems, um, make sh making sure it's free of cracks, gaps, corrosion that could cause a release of hazardous waste. Um, you're gonna look at leakage and other proper operation if you have a leakage detection system, um, deterioration or cracking of the drip pad surface. So um, also under this, you wanna look at your collection systems to, uh, to make sure they're empty as soon as possible after any storm event um, to make sure you can maintain that design capacity of that um, collection system. Um, so your inspections for your sumps, you wanna conduct a daily um, inspection for as a large quantity generator, weekly if you're a small quantity generator, um, you're going to inspect your sumps and pits for pumps to ensure they are operable, inspect areas for indications of corrosion or release, look at your secondary containment system to detect signs of, of release. Um, your secondary containment system, it should not have any material in it um, when you're inspecting those. Your hazardous waste containers, um, that inspection is required weekly. Um, you always want to inspect um, your hazardous waste area for proper labeling. Make sure that hazardous waste label is there. Make sure there's an accumulation start date on there. Um, make sure it identifies the hazard, has to have that DLT placard or something similar on there. Make sure they're closed. Um, and then the condition of a container, you're going to look for sign of leakage, sign of corrosion, uh, other things to make sure there's a liner in there. Make sure it's not blocked. You can get into it. You can get into the area um, without having to go around other equipment. So those are some things you want to look for on your hazardous waste container inspections. Uh, for your cease dripping, um, so your facility must maintain records to document that treated wood is held on the pad until dripping has ceased. Um, those records can be written or electronic, um, but it must be documented after each charge. Um, those records must be sufficient enough to document that all treated wood is held on that pad. Um, your drip pad certification, it is required annually unless um, the pad has a leak detection system. Um, so there are certain design requirements if you have a leak detection system. Um, it needs to be able to detect the failure of the drip pad or the presence of a release of hazardous waste or liquid at the earliest practical time. Um, any written assessments of the trip, drip pad must be maintained by the site and reviewed and certified by a qualified professional engineer that attests to the design requirements. Um, there are inspection form templates that can be available upon request. Um, you would just contact Michael Collins and he can get that um, template for you um, if you need one um, for your drip pad inspections. So plans and programs, um, other requirements to comply with the regulation. You have your storage yard drippage plan, your plant operating history, and your annual training um, that is required. So your storage yard drippage plan should indicate how you will look for drips on the storage yard. Um, and you must have some type of method or process in place to clean and move that material back to the drip pad. Um, your plant operating history, um, that's just gonna have all the chemicals that your plant has um, operated with um, in the past and currently. Um, so it's, you should maintain that history in some file there. Um, and then your training for hazardous waste that is required annually. Okay, reporting. 
Okay, so there are reporting requirements um, for large quantity generator. There's a biannual report that's required. Um, some states do require annual reports, so it is state specific. So you would just need to know your state um, rules as far as reporting. Um, and then there's manifest exceptions. So when a generator does not receive a copy of the manifest with a handwritten signature um, of the owner or operator of the designated facility uh, within 45 days for a large quantity generator or 60 days for a small quantity generator, um, you must submit a copy of the manifest to the EPA regional administrator in the region uh, that you're located um, to make sure you get a copy of that form. There are also spill reporting requirements for reportable quantity determination. So if there is a release of any waste, um, you, know, you may have to contact the National Response Center or the NRC based on a reportable quantity of the material. Um, you can find out any reportable quantity determinations in section 15 of the safety data sheet in the regulatory section. Um, it will tell you what the reportable quantity amount is for that chemical. You know, For example, for CCA, the reportable quantity is one pound to the environment. Um, for ACZA, it's 18 pounds. So you will be able to find that information um, on that safety data sheet. Um, some other uh, improvement rule, small quantity generators must notify the agency every four years starting last year and then every four years using EPA form 8700-12. That notification must be submitted by September 1st of each year in which re-notifications are required. Um, for additional information on that, um, the Code of Federal Regulations is um, 262.18. So the improvement rules. Uh, so some of the improvement rules that are in place um, center around episodic generation. Um, so it allows a very small quantity generator or a small quantity generator to maintain, maintain their current generator status instead of having to comply with additional requirements of the higher generator category. Um, so you can dispose of waste without having to become a large quantity generator under the episodic generator um, improvement rule. Um, one of the caveats is this, you have to notify um, the state at least 30 days prior to initiating a planned event. Um, so if you know you need to dispose of material that's over your generator category, um, let's say today is February 8th, um, when you send that notification, you can't start that planned event until at least after March 8th. So when you submit that, you have to have your start date being 30 days from the date that you submit that um, planned event. Um, if there's an unplanned event, the facility must notify the agency within 72 hours after that unplanned event. Um, so that is the episodic generation um, rule as a part of that generator improvement rule, and it allows you to maintain your generator status without moving into the large quantity generator category. So other um, changes, that rule includes over 60 changes to the hazardous waste generator regulations. Um, again, it, it makes it a lot, um, it's, put, it's put a lot of the uncertainties in the policy into one place, so it makes it very easy to read. Um, it's a lot of changes to that rule. So there is an EPA fact sheet on the generator improvement rule. So, it's great to go in there and read them just to see if they apply to your site as well. But another thing is that you want to make sure it applies to your state because not all states have adopted those rules. So where the rule is, a, is in effect, um, you can look on this map here. Um, it was last updated in December 2021, this map was. Um, so states that are yellow, they have neither adopted nor authorized the generator improvement rules. The green states, um, those generator improvement rules are authorized. Blue states, they have adopted the generator improvement rules. Um, and then any of the purple states is administered by the EPA region. Um, so it is important to know um, where those rules have been adopted and where they have not been adopted. That was quick again. Okay, anyone have any questions? I don't have any questions so far. Somebody okay. could be typing as we speak, but I don't see anything popping up. Okay. Thank you, April. 
very informative. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, poll question number five. Okay, we're at 85% with 70% and just went down to 67% false. So false is in the lead so far. We're at Well, okay, Sarah, did you ready to wrap it up? It must be a glitch. I don't know why it's not closing. It's showing closed on my screen, so I don't know what's I don't know what's going on with it. Okay, we'll move on. <clears throat> it's time for a break, everyone. Uh, looks like it's uh, five to two Pacific time. Why don't we break till uh, two ten Pacific time and then come back two ten. See you then. Yep, I don't know what's wrong with it, Melinda. It says closed in the box. Yeah, it does. Let me put another one in the screen and see if that helps. No? I don't know. <laughs> well, well, if we can't get the last one, we'll just explain to them there was a glitch in the system. It's not a big deal. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. Go take your break. Yes, ma'am. All right. See you in a minute. See you in a minute.
Hey, Grady. Hello, Belinda. Yeah, it's Rebecca. Rebecca. Yeah. I was going to say that's Rebecca. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't yep. see your picture. Sorry, right, it's just me. <laughs> uh, Belinda, are we going to pull up the, Rebecca's presentation? Yes, it's it would be help. It would be helpful. It's there. Are y'all not seeing no. it? It's not. There. It's still showing the poll, Belinda. I cannot. I've tried everything I can think of. Oh. I can't get that thing off the screen. Um. Oh. I'm gonna Monday try to launch. Two. I, I just launched the other one, or I just tried to open the other one. Okay, that's what I was gonna do too. Okay. You want to you want to go ahead and do that and then close it. Okay. Yeah, that's huh. that's going to work. Maybe. Okay. <laughs> we'll see. Okay, so just everybody go ahead and vote on this. <laughs> Right now we've got 30%, 91% at true, which is good. That's good for the material. That's great. And then we'll close that poll and hopefully we'll get our screen back. All Sorry, right, it's, I don't, all I see poll. is my, I see my screen. So, okay. Uh, got this it. one is still here. Hmm. And now that one is still there. So I don't know. Let's apologize, people. I just don't know what's going on with it. We've not had this issue before, of course. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to go in and try to delete all of the polls off of the seminar and see if that works. OK. All right, please be patient, everybody. We apologize. We've had all kinds of glitches today. I told Sarah it must be a full moon. Oh, it must be hung up somewhere because it's, here we go. Okay. See if that works. Nope, didn't work. Hmm. Sarah, can you just leave and close out of the? Yeah, I can. Let me quit, and that way, maybe that will help. And then Belinda will be in charge. Right. Okay. I'll try that. Let's give Sarah a moment to join us again. Can you, are you seeing now the, the screen? Yes, nothing's, nothing's changed. Oh, it's so odd. Did anything change? Nope. Hmm. 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 Uh, hmm. All right. I don't know why this is not doing what it's supposed to do. 
I don't even know how to undo it. Should we just continue with the presentations and or everybody can log out and log back on? Hmm. Well, that'll be a pleasant reboot. <laughs> um, uh, I can't think of anything else to do. I can't Although either. Sarah's the main organizer, so she's the one who, if she logged out and logged back in, that should have worked. Should have worked, but it didn't. Yeah, I, and I did try a couple things too, and they didn't. That didn't work. All right, let's do that, Sarah. Um, uh, can, can can everybody hear my voice? Um, we're gonna have everybody log out and and rejoin the meeting. And I apologize for this, everyone. Hopefully, this will work. <laughs>